And now on Book TV, it's your opportunity to talk live with Professors Cornell West and Robert George. Professor West has written many books, including Race Matters and Brother West, Living Out Loud. Professor George's books include Making Men Moral and Conscience and Its Enemies. Robert George, when did you first meet the man sitting next to you? Must have met in the 1990s, a little while after Brother Cornell uh, came to Princeton. And uh, we were together in faculty seminars, uh, I think under the auspices of the Center for Human Values. But we didn't know each other very well. We would just say hello to each other. We interacted a bit in the seminars. We began teaching together in 2007, and there's a whole story behind that. I don't know if you want me to go into that kind of detail, but that's, that's when our teaching partnership and our friendship really began, 2007. How did that teaching partnership begin, Professor West? And there was a brother named Andrew, whose name, last Pearl name, Mother. Pearl, Andrew, Andrew, Andrew Good student. Pearl Mother. He studied had, with both of them. He had set up a magazine. I think it was called Green. Green light. He was teaching my course on uh, public intellectuals, Erasmus, David Hume, and Matthew Arnold, and Edward Zaid. He was taking a course from you with Civil Liberties. Civil yeah. Liberties. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he asked me who I would like to have dialogue with who was a conservative. I said, oh, there's one brother I'd love to. I haven't had a chance to have a chance to engage in dialogue with. And it's Robbie George. So we got together. We had about a 45-minute dialogue based on the recording. The recording was over. Brother Andrew left. We continued to talk for at least two or three hours, walked back to the car, continued to talk, That's and right. said, we've got to continue this conversation. We've been going for now 11 to 12 years all around the country teaching at, at Princeton. Pri primarily, what's the name of our course? Adventures of Ideas. Adventures kind of, of based Ideas. Based on Alfred That's North right. Whitehead's a great, great classic. That's but right. we've had a wonderful time. I've learned so much from Brother Robbie. Uh, and vice versa. And, and this is his family uh, is just magnificent. It's Cynthia and the others. And he's been so good to me and my family. We just love to uh, engage the subject matter. We know the truth is bigger than us. We know goodness is bigger than us. And beauty is certainly bigger than us. But we quest for it. We aspire to it. I'll tell you, you a bit more about, uh, about our meeting, our, uh, uh, our meeting that began the teaching partnership. Uh, the Green Light, the magazine that Andrew Perlmutter and well, some other light, students yeah. were beginning, yeah. Green Light, Green Bag. No, well, Green Light because it comes from the last oh, of paragraph of uh, F. Scott Fitzgerald's sure. Great Gathering. Yeah, that's right. So uh, they wanted to have as a feature in each issue uh, an interview of one professor by another professor. So uh, Andrew was a religion major, as I recall, yes, right? Yes, that's right. Uh, that's so right. so uh, for the very first issue, they contacted Brother Cornell and said, we'd like you to do the interview. Who would you like to interview? And he kindly said that he would like to interview me. So technically what that was was not a conversation. It was uh, uh, an interview. It ended up, of Ooh, course, being true. a very deep conversation. That's true. That's true. So, um, so Andrew came to me then and said, uh, Professor George, uh, we're starting a magazine. We'd like to have an interview feature in each issue. We'd like uh, the first interview to uh, be uh, feature Brother West, Cornell West, as the interviewer. And, and we told him that he could interview anybody he wanted. And, and he said he'd like to interview you. Would you be willing to be interviewed by Professor West? And I said, Andrew, let me get this straight. He went to <laughs> Professor West and said he could interview anybody he wanted. And he said he'd like to interview me. And Andrew said, that's right. And I said, well, I want you to send a message back to Professor West. I want you to tell Professor West that Professor George says, but it is I who should be seeking baptism from you. <laughs> and unfortunately, Brother Andrew, who's a brilliant kid and a religion major, did not catch that reference that <laughs> to John the Baptist's baptism of Jesus oh, in, the, uh, no, in the Jordan no, River. So, no. so he responded by saying, huh? <laughs> and I said, well, just, just tell him that. He'll, he'll understand what I'm talking about. He said, okay, I'll tell him that, but will you do it? And I said, of course I'll do it. So, uh, so uh, we had that wonderful dialogue, which was recorded, and then we went on and on and on after that, all the way down uh, to the car, and I'm holding my, um, uh, my hand on the uh, car latch for about a half hour while we're continuing <laughs> well, we're to, to chat so away. True. And then just a couple of weeks after that, uh, we got, uh, the senior members of the faculty got an, a letter from the dean of the college, Nancy Malkiel, hmm. saying, uh, we want to encourage more of our senior faculty members to teach freshman seminars. We want more interaction between our, uh, our top, more established scholars and the, and the freshmen. So when I saw that letter uh, and, uh, and a request that we, that we teach these seminars, 
it immediately occurred to me that, well, you know, what we should do is just have that conversation that Cornell and I were having That's right. with 16 wonderful, bright, enthusiastic Princeton freshmen. Why only 16? Why'd you limit it? Well, that's, we did that's, 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 that's Princeton's yeah, rule, no, and, and there was a story behind that as well, of course, because once the word got out that we were going to be teaching this together, there was, oh, there was, yeah. a, big, we, we there was a, a big demand. and uh, uh, We had to read all the essays to see which particular 16 we would choose. And, and then after that, we decided we just aren't going to try to do that. We would just let the registrar's office choose randomly, and then the registrar's office decided that they would do it on a first-come, first-served basis, and students were supposed to sign up, or they could start signing up at 7 o'clock on a particular morning, and of course at 7 o'clock that morning they crashed the computer system. <laughs> so, uh, that's, no, that's true. Uh, so but that's a beautiful thing about Princeton. I should say, even as one who teaches at Harvard, I think Princeton does I'm, have I'm the, still the highest quality undergraduate <laughs> education in terms of hands-on, 16 students there, each senior writes a senior thesis, still focus very much on the undergrads and Harvard and Yale and Berkeley and Chicago and Howard University and others of wonderful places but when it comes to high quality undergraduate education Princeton's number one I must say. Well, well it should come back. Well I, I love Harvard and Yale and Princeton I love and Howard too. and Morehouse too I but I'm just, I believe in the truth so I believe in speaking the truth no matter St. Olaf's is in the running too <laughs> Oh, indeed, indeed. But no, well, Prince Cornell West something. and Robert George, we've invited you on to talk about your books, but why haven't you written a book together? Well, we, we've talked about we've that talked a lot, and it. we have both Harvard University uh, Press and Princeton University Press who are interested in having us yeah. do that for them, and we'd both very much uh, like to do it. The trouble is you've got two really busy guys with a lot of responsibility and obligations. We have traveled around the country Ooh, doing, uh, doing public dialogues and conversations and so forth. So we will get to it. We uh, will get we to haven't, it. Uh, we haven't yet. Now, we've done some, some interviews together. We recently had one in... Um, was it the Washington Times or the Washington. Washington Examiner? Quite a lengthy one, as a matter yeah. of fact. Oh, absolutely. And also in the Princeton Magazine. Yeah, that's right, Princeton Alumni Princeton. Magazine. Well, Princeton one of the Alumni things you do in your book, Professor George, The Clash of Orthodoxies, is you allow other scholars to rebut you in your, <laughs> in your views. Well, I think that's, uh, that's how philosophy works. That's how education works. That's how learning works. That's how scholarship uh, proceeds, especially, though not exclusively, uh, in the humanities and social sciences. Uh, we learn by giving an argument, providing reasons, producing evidence, then letting a critic respond to that. This is how intellectual life in the Western tradition, and certainly the field of philosophy, began with, with Socrates engaging mm -hmm. critics, mm -hmm. uh, subjecting their views to criticism and permitting them to subject his views to criticism. Right. Uh, right. Cornell and I are old-fashioned Socratic scholars. We both believe in that kind of education. And you both spend a lot of time talking about Socrates and Aristotle. Absolutely. In your books. Very much so. You know, Erasmus used to say, Saint Socrates, pray for me. <laughs> Here he's a Christian. Both of us yeah. are Christians. We understand the richness of the Socratic legacy of Athens tied to the prophetic legacy of Jerusalem, which is to say that self-interrogation, self-questioning, what the Greeks call paideia, P-A-I-D-E-I-A, -E -I -I which is deep education, not cheap schooling. That kind of transformative dialogue that makes us examine our basic assumptions and presuppositions. We That's talk it. about this all the time. How do we learn how to die? You die when you give up a certain set of assumptions and presuppositions and become more mature, more willing to grow and develop because you're learning how to live as you learn how to die. And education is very much a matter of trying to kill the prejudice, the presuppositions, the narrow dogmas, the narrow ways in which you view the world in order to be expansive, knowing you're still going to end up finite, fallible, endless progress, endless possibility, always the end and aim of what you're after. Would, would it be fair to say that your books are all about self-examination in a way? Right, but but self-examination in the Socratic sense, but also the prophetic legacy of Jerusalem, because he's as a Christian, uh, uh, it's more than just self-examination. It's a matter of self-surrender. It's a matter of self-emptying. It's a matter of self-giving. So when Jesus is on that cross, he's just not examining himself. He's giving himself. He's emptying himself at the deepest level. Take this love and see what you can do with it because I love you so. 
so that what you actually get is Socratic legacy of self-examination, but the legacies of Jerusalem, Judaism, Christianity, Muslim, Muslim, Islam, and so forth, is really one of self-surrendering to something bigger than you, so that you get that fusion of Socratic self-examination and prophetic witness. Because you, because you can't love unless you take a risk. You can't love unless you're vulnerable. You can't love unless you do what Brother Robbie and I try to do. It's what. Given our disagreements, we know as human beings, and this person is made in the image of God, that there's some human overlap. So that whatever the barriers are, we're going to find that overlap even as we honestly wrestle with the various issues that we, uh, that, that we fight over in a way. One of the points that I uh, make to our students uh, is to uh, render yourself capable of self-surrender, which as a Christian I agree with yes. uh, Cornell yeah. as our ultimate uh, obligation and indeed fulfillment. That's the great paradox of Christianity, that our fulfillment is in surrendering ourselves and being Christ-like. But I stress that to get there, to the point where you are capable of that, you need self-mastery. You need to be able to control your own wayward desires, uh, your own wants, your own passions, put them under the control of reason. Plato teaches us that in the well-ordered soul, mm -hmm. reason is in charge and appetite or passion is under the control of reason. When things are disordered, passion is in charge and reason is instrumentalized and harnessed to the goal of creating rationalizations for activity that can only really harm us and harm others. Now how do we get to self-mastery? Here's where self-examination, the examined life, mm. liberal arts education comes in. We get to self-mastery by subjecting ourselves to criticism, interrogating our own assumptions, mm -hmm. putting on the table even our most cherished, our deepest, even identity-forming beliefs. And that's a big challenge because people don't want to do that. It's difficult for any of us to do that. We human beings, being human, mm -hmm. we tend to wrap our emotions around our convictions. Which is good in a way, because if we didn't do that, we would never be motivated to act for worthy causes, for justice, for the common good, for human rights, for human dignity. And yet, if we wrap our emotions too tightly around our convictions, we become dogmatists. Mm -hmm. We abandon any possibility of subjecting ourselves, our assumptions, our arguments to criticism. We become incapable of being what we should all aspire to be, and that is interrogators of ourselves. Well, in your book, Making Men Moral, you write, laws cannot make men moral, only men can do that, and they can do it only by freely choosing to do the morally right thing for the right reason. Professor West, is that something you agree with? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I think what Brother Robbie's getting at is something so badly needed in our present day because we get this we live in this market driven society obsessed with spectacle and image and position and money and status that you lose quality of character quality of soul what we could call soul craft and soul craft has to do with the ways of being human you choose as it relates to various virtues and as it relates to various values so when Brother Robbie talks about moral character, that's something that, uh, that the market can't teach you. That's something that uh, being a professional can't teach you. There's something deeper going on. It's got to shape and mold you. It's fundamentally about that self-surrender. It's about love. It's about integrity, honesty, decency, generosity. I mean, when we talk about self-mastery in regard to Socrates, one of the great questions of Western civilization is always, why did Socrates never cry? And Jesus never laughed. See, Socrates never crying meant he puts a primacy on self-mastery, rightly so. But self-mastery is not the proper response to your mother's funeral. But if you, tears is the proper response. Because you love. Jesus wept because he loved so. Socrates never cries. So there's a love for wisdom that's important. But you've got to out-Socratize Socrates <laughs> and make your way to Jerusalem. Jerusalem begins with tears. The tears of a hated people, the tears of a persecuted deep people, the tears of an enslaved people, of Jews vis-a-vis -vis Pharaoh. And Jesus weeps for Jerusalem. He weeps for Lazarus precisely because he loves so. 
so that the self-mastery still has a role, but it's not enough. The self-surrender, that's where the tears come, because tears shatters the numbness inside of one's heart, shatters callousness, shatters indifference, and what lets one know, lo and behold, you are a human being like everybody else. You calling for help like everybody else. And as you know, my brother, because I know you attend black churches, and congratulations on 25 years of working in this magnificent place. But when you go to those black churches, the best of those black churches is what? We are people who've been hated for 400 years, but we're teaching the world so much about how to love. That's John Coltrane's Love Supreme. That's Martin Luther King Jr.'s Love Ethic. That's James Baldwin's Love Soak Essays. That is high quality soul craft. Brother Robbie linked in his own way, in his own tradition to that. I linked my own way to my own tradition, even given our disagreements on the various issues. You know, any human being ultimately faces the question, what's the point of my life? Yeah, yes. What's worth living for? That's right. What's worth doing? That's right. What's worthwhile? Now, every human being is going to be in a certain culture, is going to be formed by that culture, is going to have to act in the context of that culture, is going to have to react to what is coming at him or her in that, in that culture. And for just about any, every human being, there are going to be powerful temptations because it's easy to believe. In fact, we live in a culture that reinforces our belief that what's worth living for is status, mm -hmm. prestige, social standing, mm -hmm. wealth, power. That's right. Now, those are not in themselves bad things, and I think it's a mistake to condemn those as if they were bad in themselves. Wealth isn't bad in itself. Power isn't bad in itself. Depends on how you use those things. But to make them what's fundamental, to make them the ultimate goal, is to fail to see what human life is really all about and what is worthwhile in human life. And this is our mission for ourselves and for our students, to make people understand that integrity, honor, right. decency, these are what are truly fundamental. These are what make life worth living. This is what we should aspire to not in itself for their own sakes wealth or glory or power or influence or status or social standing now that's a big challenge for young men and women who are super high achievers and we've been blessed to teach oh, those kinds yeah. of students our entire lives at places like princeton and harvard those students are going somewhere mm -hmm. and they've got big futures in investment banking as lawyers in medicine and other fields. And they can do a lot of good in all of those fields. But they really face powerful temptations to believe that it is standing, it is status, it is influence, it is power, it is wealth, it is being looked up to by other people that is what really matters. And you really haven't gotten there. And nobody's finally there <laughs> through our entire lives. But you haven't even gotten close to being there until you've got the strength of character, the self-mastery, to be willing for the sake of what's right, what's good, what's true, to sacrifice it all. Now you try telling a Princeton student, or a Harvard student, or a Williams student, or a St. Olaf student, or really any student these days in this culture, you might be called on to give all that up, to stand up for what you believe in. You may arrive at a view, if you're truly open-minded, if you're truly willing to listen, if you truly engage, you might arrive at a set of opinions that marks you as an outsider, as a bad guy, as somebody to be rejected. Now, are you going to have the integrity to stand for that, knowing that it could cost you professionally, Absolutely. in terms of further education, social standing, your friends and things like that? When we think back to Socrates, Cornell and mm -hmm. I, we remember how he died. Had the hemlock, the hemlock. They made him drink the hemlock. He was a martyr. Indicted by his fellow citizens. He refused to go silent on the truth, even when the truth was unpopular. Exactly what People he said. didn't want to hear it. Line 24a in Plato's Apology, Parhesia was the cause of my unpopularity. Parhesia Plain speaking. Frank Plain. speech, fearless speech, unintimidated speech. That plain speech, and it can get you in deep trouble. I mean, Brother Robbie, I mean, he gets in a lot of deep trouble. In, I do. In conservative circles, <laughs> partly just hanging out with me. I get in a lot of trouble. But in addition to that, 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 that he's willing to, 
deal with unpopularity based on his own commitment to his understanding of what it is to be a person of integrity. And, uh, and I try to do that within my own uh, progressive circles as well because it's not a question of popularity. We reject the chains of conformity. We want to be non-conformist. We want to be in the world and not of the world. We want to be over against the world. We want to be tied to a kingdom that is so much greater and grander than this world. I learned at Shiloh Baptist Church under Willie P. Cook, my great pastor, if the kingdom of God is within you, then everywhere you go, you ought to leave a little heaven behind. Hmm. Now, that kingdom of God means what? In this world, it's a world of coldness, cruelty, domination, oppression, hatred, envy, resentment. That's the dominant ways of the world. What you're going to do now that you're in it? How you going to come to terms with it? Be ye nonconformist. Not out of self-righteousness. And we keep, try to keep each other accountable there because... You can always fade into a self-righteousness and not acknowledge the self-critical character of your own stances that you take. You know, the problem for human beings generally is that we tend to be tribal. And tribalism today mm -hmm. is a big problem. Oh, major. In All our, around the world. In our culture. All around. In, in, in this in culture. culture around. In our culture. Uh, and uh, uh, people will expect you to play for the team. But if your own convictions, your own reflections, your own inquiries lead you to a view that puts you outside the team on this one, yeah, yeah. and you publicly dissent, well, you can be in very big trouble. That doesn't, that, that, that's true whether you're a progressive like Brother Cornell or conservative like me in the, uh, in, the, in the most recent presidential campaign. I could not, in the end, bring myself to vote for Donald Trump. I just regarded him as morally unfit to be president of the United States. I don't want to litigate that right here. I'm, I'm just using this as an example. And uh, because I wouldn't play for the team, I got a lot of heat from the team. Well, you want to elect Hillary Clinton. Well, actually, I didn't want to elect Hillary Clinton. I opposed her, too. I saw of her as, if anything, worse than Donald Trump. That got a lot of pushback, of course, from other people. But Cornell found himself in the same position. When oh, he absolutely. refused to support Hillary Clinton after she had gotten the nomination, having supported Bernie Sanders, oh, brother Bernie, yeah. he got the same heat I was getting on the conservative side from the liberal side, from the progressive uh, side, from, from the left. But he wouldn't yield. You know, he, he, mm. he wouldn't say, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stay silent on this for the team. Between the two of you, how many times have you been arrested? Have been arrested? Yeah. I've been going to jail. He, he's, he's the jail goer. Yeah, I'm not yeah, yeah. I've, I've quit. Now, I have, quit I have offered, I've I don't know how many count. times, to, to that, bail you out. Now, that's true, though. <laughs> exactly. When I was in, uh, when the last time was it down in uh, Ferguson, I think it was, or maybe it was in St. Louis, or whatever it was, that it was true. And I, 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 I got a call from my brother. How much money do you need? <laughs> he knows I'm broke as a Ten Commandments <laughs> <laughs> financially sometimes. But, it was, but that's just the kind of you know, love and respect and support that he that, that he has, though, but I, I, I've, I've quit I'll tell you, though, actually. I'll tell you yeah. a wonderful story about this. <laughs> so in, uh, was it, Cornell, was it uh, 2016, I believe, uh, I was being sworn in as uh, chairman oh, yes. of the United States yeah. Commission on uh, yeah. International Religious Freedom. I had served uh, uh, on the commission and was elected uh, chairman. So I was being uh, sworn in uh, as chairman by Chief Justice John Roberts at the, uh, at the Supreme Court. Uh, so I asked Brother Cornell if, uh, if he uh, would do me the honor of holding the Bible for me. Not just uh, any Bible. Uh, well, yes, that's true. We, uh, we, uh, yeah. we got uh, the wonderful people at the... Uh, uh, Upstate New York. At uh, the... Uh, uh, where is that? Uh, it's somewhere in Upstate, around Syracuse. It's it? somewhere up there, yeah. yeah. Uh, but this Bible is a special Bible. It was uh, Harriet, Tubman. Harriet Tubman's Bible. Yeah. Oh, it was the Harriet Tubman House. That's what yeah, it was Harriet Tubman House. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. Uh, so the wonderful people there yeah. uh, gave us the, the Bible on loan. Great big, beautiful Bible. So I, I can imagine what that must have cost a poor woman in Harriet Tubman's time, an ex-slave with no money, uh, to, to purchase that Bible. It tells you something about her faith about and, absolutely. And, and how she must absolutely. have treasured that Bible. But in any event, they, they, uh, they gave us the Bible on loan for Cornell to hold when I was being sworn in in Chief Justice Roberts' chambers uh, by the Chief Justice. Well, as we were walking up the 
steps in front of the Supreme Court to go into oh, the man. building. I'm walking with Brother Cornell, and as we walk past a couple of police officers, security police, I see one of them catch Cornell's eye. <laughs> and, and the two of them, Cornell and, and the officer, <laughs> stare at each other for a moment, then give each other a little head nod, and, uh, and uh, we continue walking in. And I turned to Brother Cornell and I said, well, what was that all about? And he said, well, Brother Robbie, um, this is the first time I've ever been to the Supreme Court when I wasn't here to get arrested. <laughs> and that's the officer who arrested me. <laughs> he had just arrested me a few me. weeks early. <laughs> and just a me. few weeks early. That was on Martin Luther King Day. <sighs> yeah. we, were, we, we, we went to jail, I think, for a critique of Wall Street or something like but that. Chief so, Justice but, Roberts uh, was so gracious. But no, so absolutely. And your beloved yeah. parents, parents were there. there. That yeah. was a magnificent, yeah. uh, magnificent moment, though. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely right. There is a new 25th edition out of your best-selling book, Race Matters. And in the new introduction to that book, Cornell West, you write, we live in one of the darkest moments in American history, a bleak time of spiritual blackout and imperial meltdown. Yeah, yeah, by spiritual blackout, I mean the relative eclipse of integrity, honesty, and decency. I mean that we have normalized mendacity, which is to say we've made lies a normal way of life and we've naturalized criminality, which is to say we've made crimes look as if they are natural. It could be drone strikes. It could be Wall Street elites engaged in predatory lending or market manipulation. None of them go to jail. It could be so many different ways in which uh, hum people's humanity is violated. And uh, what we need is I call for prophetic fight back because in a moment of spiritual blackout is not just a political issue. It's a moral and a spiritual issue as well. And it's only by example. We need young people to say, look, he's a conservative brother, progressive brother, still have love, still have respect, willing to fight, willing to disagree, not in the abstract, by example. They want to see sermons. They don't want to just hear them. Why? Because the Right now, the, the dominant soul craft in the American empire is a neoliberal soul craft. Smartness, smartness, smartness. It's like how many times do you, you, you hear the word on television, obvious, obvious, obvious. This is ob obviously, obviously this, obviously that. See, that's, that, 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 that's, that's a word for the in crowd to show that they're part of the smart crowd. Well, bro Brother that's Robbie true. and I, you see, we don't believe in smartness in this isolation. We believe in wisdom at its deepest level. And smartness is tied to richness. There's no accident that Donald Trump believes he's really the smartest in the room and the richest in the room. That's just a sign of his spiritual vacuity and emptiness. But he's a sign and symptom of a society that has idolized smartness and richness. And we won't even talk about bombs. I mean, what is Barack Obama dropped 26,172 bombs his last year. He got the Nobel yeah, Peace Prize. Something like five times as many drone strikes with, you know, George Bush got 45 Bush of drone strikes. He got a 506, but he wins the Nobel Peace Prize. So that what happens is this spectacle can hide and conceal what real substance is when it comes to morality and spirituality. And this is where it breaks through ideology. It's not just right wing, left wing, center. It's moral and spiritual substance is always deeper than any political ideology, you see. And so what I'm trying to say in this, in this introduction is we are in catastrophic times. Ecological catastrophe, nuclear catastrophe, moral catastrophe of just survival of the slickest and the smartest. But then there's also economic catastrophe. Grotesque wealth inequality. The top three individuals in America have wealth equivalent to the bottom 160 million. Three brothers have wealth equivalent to 50% of our fellow citizens. This is grotesque. This looks like the Louis XIV times and so forth, you see. And now, of course, we've got a tax bill now. Well to do, off tightening the benefits for the poor. You say, wait a minute, as Christians, we say, what you do to the least of these, you do unto us, the orphan, the widow, the fatherless, the motherless, the poor, the immigrant, the Muslim, the Jew, the black, the indigenous people, the gay, the lesbian, and so forth and so on. That's a moral and spiritual orientation. And so that book is very much about where are we 25 years after I wrote the book in 93, and times are bleaker, times are bleaker, spiritually and morally. You agree with that? 
I agree with the basic basic thrust of it. Now, Cornell and I disagree about things like markets, uh, whether uh, inequality in itself is a bad right. thing, economic right. inequality right. is a bad right. thing. Uh, I think our right. problem is not uh, the market economy. I, I believe in the market economy. I think the market economy has lifted millions of people out of poverty. My uh, critique is that we have traded in a true market economy for a kind of crony capitalism mm, mm, where uh, mm, big and mm, powerful mm. firms yeah. uh, can use yeah. government, can use big government Absolutely. Uh, to uh, regulate competitors uh, off, the, off the field. Uh, big firms can afford the, uh, afford the price of regulation and sometimes welcome it because they know that small and upstart competitors right. uh, cannot uh, welcome it. When it comes to uh, economic equality, I do not mind inequality. And, and I think in any just system there will be inequal economic inequality. I don't have as a goal economic qual equality. I, I have as a goal equality and dignity, the equality of the Declaration of Independence when it says that all men are created equal. We're all of equal worth. But I've chosen a career as an academic. I know that's not a high-paying, a particularly high-paying field. Mm -hmm. I could have uh, gone to law school. I would have made a lot more money. I could have gone to business school and made a lot more money than, uh, than that, because generally lawyers work for people who make more money than they uh, do. coming they from those do. schools. Yeah, coming, coming from those, those schools. schools. Yeah, so absolutely. Uh, I don't have any uh, problem with, uh, as long as it's fair, uh, I don't have any problem with people having even a lot more money than other people. My worry is not for equality of economic equality. My worry is for opportunity. My big worry about our society is we are losing and have to a considerable extent lost the prospects for upward mobility for an Absolutely. awful lot of our fellow citizens. Absolutely. I grew up in West Virginia in central Appalachia. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I remain close to people there. My entire family is still back there. My parents are there. My brothers are there. Uh, all of my family, my, my high school friends, so many of my friends and relatives are there. This was Donald Trump country. Now, why? Because they are feeling the effects of being neglected, of being left behind. Economically, culturally, they feel without uh, uh, bigotry or prejudice but certainly on the basis of uh, their own experience, as if there is a cultural elite, a wealthy, powerful cultural elite that has only its own interests in mind, not the interests of working people in places like Central Appalachia, and who have nothing but contempt for the values of people in Central Appalachia. Those were Trump voters. So I'm not one of these guys who condemns Trump voters. I'm not a fan of Donald Trump. I wasn't from the beginning. And I'll give him credit for some good things he's done, but I'll still criticize him for some bad things that he's done. But I think that it's a mistake to imagine that those supporters of Donald Trump are just racists and bigots and, and horrible people. They had legitimate grievances, which no one in either party, the establishment of neither party, responded to. And Donald Trump reached out to them. Whether they were wise to look to him as their tribune, that's another, we can debate that. I have debated that with my relatives and friends uh, oh, in, 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 in West Virginia. But he noticed that those people were forgotten, were left behind, were looked down on, were held in contempt, were was waged on their economy, and he benefited. Well, Cornell West, you, do you agree with what he's saying about the Trump voters? Well, I mean, the Trump voters, they're a diverse lot. He's got a slice of them who are in fact xenophobic and racist and sexist and misogynist and homophobic, but that doesn't exhaust the whole group. Brother Robbie acknowledges there's a racist slice of Trump voters. You acknowledge there's a racist slice of them. No uh, these doubt about these that. arrows that you see sticking out of me, they come from the alt-right. <laughs> they are I, absolutely. I'm, I'm considered the great Satan, you know, the one of the great Satans. Jewish the, and a whole host of other the things. But, but there's, a, there, but, the but there, but there's, there, there's also a slice of Trump voters who had voted for Bernie and had voted for Obama. That's you right. See? So that you got to keep track of that diversity of them. You, you never want to downplay the role of the vicious legacy of white supremacy in the country. There's no doubt about that. But precisely because it's so vicious, you can't allow it to be the only thing you see. I mean, you get this out of Brother Coates and some of the other younger black intellectuals these days, where all you can see is white supremacy. White supremacy is always linked to something else. It's linked to predatory capitalism. It's linked to slavery. It's linked to Jim Crow. It's linked to patriarchy. It's linked to homophobia. It's linked to transphobia. It's also linked to empire. 
You can have black and white soldiers come together and go to the Philippines and treat the Philippines like they're cockroaches in the name of America. Because you've you got an empire in that point. So you have to be very honest in telling the truth. So Brother, Brother Robbie and I say, look, we look at Trump voters, let's tell the truth of who they are. They are a heterogeneous lot. Many of them were suffering under neoliberal policies. Under Barack Obama, the top 1% got 95% of the income growth. I find that to be morally grotesque. Now, I don't agree for wholesale economic equality, mm -hmm. but I want a floor. I want to focus on poverty. I want to focus on poor well, we're working in the same people. Place and we agree that. with that. Oh, no, oh, we yeah. agree with that. Because he's a conservative I, I'm not brother worried about who is deeply concerned people. about trying about to ensure people. that poverty is attacked. He's been trying to do that in conservative circles. I've tried to do it with Barack Obama and the others. The Democratic Party has had no major concern about poor people. They've been tied to Wall Street and tied to upward mobility for the professional and middle classes. When it comes to working people who are poor, or poor people not working at all, they've had very little to say other than some movement on health care. But that's a market-driven health care program coming out of the Heritage Foundation, established by Milt Romney. Milt Romney, you know, Mormon brother, salute him, but he's not known for being on the cutting edge of fighting against poverty. But he's somebody who in the Republican Party did some very decent things in regard to health care. That's where that health care program comes from. And we want to be very honest about that. Let us try to tell the truth about both of our parties, deeply narrow when it comes to these issues of poverty. Jack Kemp and the others putting pressure on the Republican Party. The legacy of Martin King putting pressure on the Democratic Party. And so, um, but I think the other side of this thing, which we really about have to be honest about, is the market-driven corporate media that made Donald Trump the center of entertainment where they made big, 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 big money. One of the CEOs made it very clear. Donald Trump is bad for the country, good for us. Why is it good for you? Revenues, ratings. They followed every speech, every Twitter. My dear brother, Bernie Sanders got like 20 seconds for every 30 minutes that Donald Trump got. Why not have equal treatment? No, it's market driven even in the media. Thank God for C-SPAN. Can you imagine what the quality of public dialogue would be in this country without C-SPAN? Because if it depends just on corporate media, oh my God, Fox News, MSNBC, it's propaganda machines. One's a conservative propaganda machine, the other neoliberal propaganda machine. Now they're kind enough to invite us on, and we have yeah. dialogue with them and so forth. But we know, you know, you're not going to get the most balanced view out of Sean Hannity. You're not going to get the most balanced view out of Chris Hayes. They've got their own agendas. And you can't just promote your agenda. You've got to be able to interested in the truth. You've got to mention something bigger than your own agenda. You see, that's how democracies you know, this survive. Is, uh, this is highly relevant in education as mm. well, mm. Especially, especially higher education, but really K-12 K through higher education. Uh, you got to tell the truth. You have to tell the truth. At least try story. to tell the truth. You Make can't, an effort to. Yeah, yeah, I mean, too often, one extreme whitewashes American history. So you, you take out the unsavory and the, the indigenous the people, the slavery, lynching, the working slave, people, Crow, okay. labor movement. That's the right. other side tells an equally false history that this is the whole story, that the whole story of the American experience is slavery, white supremacy, imperialism, and so forth leading many of our young people to reject mm -hmm. the foundational principles of America, which are really what do make the country great. What's exceptional about America? We're human beings like other human beings. We're made of flesh and blood. We're dust of the earth, but also made in the very image and likeness of God. Mm -hmm. We're human beings like other human beings. It's not us as human beings who are exceptional. It's the principles on which the country rests. It's the principles on which we were founded that it has taken a long time for us to live up to. And we still don't live up to them fully. And we probably never will fully live up to them because they're high aspirational principles. But they're captured in that wonderful, we, we hear it so often that it becomes a cliche, but we really need to stop and listen to those words. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they're endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. And among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. A nation founded on that principle has the potential for greatness. Mm -hmm. And we need to communicate that uh, to our young people. And we need to tell mm -hmm. the truth. Yes, with the warts, but not imagining that the history is nothing but 
right. boards. When Martin Luther King appealed to the American people, he did not take a French revolutionary attitude that we need to tear down everything that came before it because it's corrupt and, and evil and we need to build something new that nobody else has ever seen before. No, 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 no. Martin Luther King looked back to the American founding, despite the fact that the man who wrote the words I quoted was a slaveholder. That did not stop King from looking back to the American founding and saying, the principle is right and good, now let's live up to the principle. Our founders wrote a check, let's cash mm. the check, let's mm. make good on mm. the check. Mm -hmm. That's what we need to do, we need to call people back to our founding principle. And I want to get to your reaction to that, sure. Professor West, in just a minute, but first, I want to welcome our viewers. This is our monthly in-depth program where we invite one author on to talk about his or her body of work. This month, it's a unique situation. We have professors Robert George and Cornell West, who for years taught a class together at Princeton. Cornell West has now returned to Harvard. Robert George remains at Princeton. Here are the numbers. Here's the way you can interact with these two. 202 is the area code. 748-8200 if you live in the east and central time zones. 202-748-8201 for those of you in the mountain and Pacific. Now, if you can't get through on the phone line, still want to make a comment? Several ways via social media, including Twitter, at Book TV, on our Facebook page. You'll see a video of these two together. You can make a comment right under there, facebook.com slash book TV, Instagram, at Book TV, and finally, email, book TV at cspan.org. Very quickly, we want to just show you a few of the books that these two have written, beginning with Cornell West, new 25th edition out, brand new of his bestseller, Race Matters, that was originally published in 1993. Democracy Matters came out in 2004. Brother West, his autobiography, came out in 2009. And his most recent book is Black Prophetic Fire 2014. Now, Robert George, a couple of his books, Making Men Moral, 1995, The Clash of Orthodoxies, 2001, Conscience and Its Enemies, 2013, and Conjugal Union is one of his most recent books, What Marriage Is and Why It Matters. We'll begin taking those phone calls in just a minute. Professor West, your reaction to what Robert George was saying just a minute ago. No, oh, I think that Brother Robbie's commitment to telling the truth and the condition of truth is always to allow suffering to speak. So if we tell the truth about America, I was looking at a book the other day by the great Bernard DeVoto called The Course of Empires, published in the 1950s. And he makes the point, of course, that the United States was a settler colonial enterprise like Canada, like New Zealand, like Australia, like Liberia, like Israel. There's a whole host of efforts of people who are escaping ugly conditions to arrive on a land and there's some other people there. And you have to decide, do you coexist, do you dominate, do you subordinate, do you engage in genocidal uh, assault or whatever. That the United States, what is distinct about the United States as a settler colonial society was it was a successful revolutionary effort to overthrow the empire from which it came, the fight against George III, with the grand ideals that Brother Robbie was talking about. And those ideals have universal implications but they still have these very ugly realities. You then have slavery. You then have white men who can't vote, who don't have property. You have women in patriarchal households. You got gay brothers and lesbians and trans and others who are marginalized. And yet, by appealing to those ideals in the context of the U.S. social experiment, we've been able to make some significant progress. How do you stay in contact with the humanity of indigenous peoples? black peoples, women, gays, lesbian, working people, Mexicans, and so forth and so on. At the same time, we've got a long way to go, no doubt about that. But it's a matter of just trying to tell the truth so we understand what are the impediments, what are the major obstacles. And I think one of the things that Brother Avi and I, we, we wrestle with, because he, he defends the market economy in the right form. He's not for crony capitalism. He's not for any kind of uh, reckless laissez-faire capitalism. He understands there's need for regulations. I mean, is that, is that fair? Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. There's right. fundamental need for regulation. And, and, and I believe that in market economies in the history of this nation, we've resulted in monopolies and oligopolies. 
the robber barons of the 1890s, you see, the financial elites today who have a disproportionate amount of power and influence but very little democratic accountability. So that the market economy, I can agree with to the degree to which it's got these thick regulations that doesn't allow for ways in which persons are thoroughly unaccountable. And that has nothing to do with trashing them. I and mean, we got Brother Harlan Crow, who is our dear brother. I was just with him this week. We had a debate with Brother Alan Dershowitz on the Palestinian question at BDS. Now, Harlan, Harlan Crow is one of the finest human beings you ever meet. Absolutely. There's just no doubt about that. There's no doubt about that. So we're not talking about the character of a particular individual. There's some other friends of his who have much less moral character than he does. Be they rich, middle class, or whatever. But it's the structure that we're talking about because oligopolies and monopolies do not lend themselves to democratic accountability to sustain democracy. But Dr. West, didn't you just kind of put everybody in a tribe and, and talk about some of the isms that you both decried a little bit earlier? Is that a fair statement? When, when we talk about class, we're really talking about the ways in which various forms of power are used and deployed. You still can keep track of their humanity as individuals. And there, are, for example, there are certain individuals who are poor who choose immoral ways of living in the world. There's middle class people who choose immoral ways. There's well-to-do people who choose immoral ways. So we're talking about character, what kinds of choices people make, but the structures that are in place are not reducible just to their character, you see. Structures have to be confronted as structures. So you can have the most benevolent class of slaveholders in the world, and slavery is still evil because the structure of slavery is evil. And we understand slavery to be, as a structure, evil. You see. And so in that sense, we don't want to reduce structures to individual characters. Characters can choose, and those choices have moral weight. They have ethical resonance. There's no doubt about that. But it's a matter of keeping track of the structures. And I think part of the, uh, the fascinating kind of uh, conversation Brother Robbie and I have is trying to deal with this complex dialectical interplay between structures and individuals, structures and persons, as it were. When he talks about making human beings moral, and if you worked on a slaveholder to become more moral without an indictment of slavery, it's still not enough. You'd agree with that? Oh, yeah, I agree. Absolutely. So uh, I have a few points to make in sure, response to what sure, Cornelius said. Sure. Uh, first is, I think the last thing we want, and we might disagree about this, but mm -hmm. the last thing we want is the socialization, the government control and ownership of the means of production. I, I see that as the yeah, high road yeah. to tyranny. So that's why I reject yeah. the socialist uh, no, no, solution. Because, because my kind of democratic socialism has a crucial role for private sector. Well, that, that seems to me yeah. very critical. Yeah. The yeah. second I thing agree. is, I agree with that. while I do believe that uh, markets need to be regulated, there should be some things that aren't for sale. Uh, yes, right? I, I agree. And, and there's a place for market values, which that's is in the market, right. and there's a, there's, right. there's a place for non-market values, and you don't want market values invading non-market familial, for example, right. uh, re relationships. Um, when it comes to regulation, this is a very tricky area. Mm, mm. Uh, I want to minimize regulation. I think the only regulations we should have are regulations that are necessary. But there are many regulations that are necessary. If we overregulate, we defeat our very purpose because what we do is we empower large enterprises who can use regulatory obstacles to prevent smaller competitors from getting into the competition. So you mm -hmm. need wise regulation. And wise regulation will let the market operate to the extent that the market can operate fairly and without uh, exploitation and without uh, undermining institutions like the family that are not built on uh, market mm -hmm. uh, principles. I think when we do that, then we do liberate the market to benefit especially less well-off people. That's what creates the um, social mobility, the economic opportunity that allows people to rise, which of course is the, is the greatest aspect of the American story when you think about it. How many people have come from other lands as immigrants to this country with nothing, shirt on their backs, and have become wealthy? 
I'd also want to point out there's just nothing wrong with being rich in itself. Depending as long on how you, you don't, became rich. You, depending you can't on how steal you somebody rich. else's land, steal that money, steal their resources. But into think you. of how many people in this country are the children or grandchildren or perhaps themselves mm -hmm. immigrants who did really come with nothing or very little and through hard work, initiative, oh, a yeah. willingness to take risk, oh, have acquired great wealth. And then think of how many of them have become generous benefactors to every worthy cause, to the cause of justice, to the cause of human health, to the cause of education. Institutions well, that, like Princeton and Harvard are profoundly that dependent kind of, that kind of on the generosity of people who have oh, a great deal of money. I mean, that's been just, this is similar to, to our dear brother Harlan and the, exactly the others right. who are magnificent in there. Philanth it, uh, but philanthropy is not justice, though. That it's that no, it, no, no, it, I, it, I agree it, with that. It, 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 it's a force for good. I mean, yeah. I, you know, you go and, down, and it means that there are power centers. It's a force for good, but it, no, go right ahead. That means that there are power centers outside of the control of government. And that's important. And I think that's, that's terribly because important. you've got to be anti-authoritarian across the board. But the problem is that if, for example, we agree that it's crony capitalism, it's predatory capitalism, and then there's no regulation. Oh, that, it, well, Then absolutely. the weak and the vulnerable are really crushed. Uh, exactly and, right. And, and, that's, and that's the way to beat that fundamentally. is to empower the competitors. It's to make the market work. It's not to do away with the market. It's not to undermine the market. It's to empower competitors to compete. Well, see, I would say more than that, though. So we, we empower the competitors. And here we would with Joseph Schoenpeter and the others, the crucial yeah. role of entrepreneurs. Not just monopolies and the oligopolies, but those new upstarts trying to gain a foothold in the market. But the other crucial countervailing force is organized labor, even given this possibility of corruption. If workers have no say in their workplace, then for the most part, given the profit-driven orientation of the elites, they're not going to be treated right. We've seen this in your beloved West Virginia. If it uh, wasn't for those, right. th those yeah. unions yeah. in the mines, they would be crushing those precious yeah. brothers of all colors. And, uh, like, I don't and, know. Uh, and, and I, I think that's yeah. a very legitimate point, but it's yeah. a, the, 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 the corruption of labor but is that's also the problem. a that's very true, legitimate the point. The corruption cuts across color, gender, sexual orientation, nation. That's who we are as a species, so we have to have some kind of... Uh, this... Kind of uh, this uh, this fall, uh, I uh, have just finished uh, teaching a seminar at Harvard Law School with mm -hmm. a colleague up there, wonderful scholar mm -hmm. named Adrian Vermeule, where we looked at uh, uh, law in light of the teaching of the modern popes, going back to Leo the Thirteenth, the traditional, th the tradition of what's called Catholic oh, yeah. social thought. And one of the things that struck me in reading through these documents again, from Rerum Novarum in uh, 1891, all the way up through the encyclical Centesimus Annus on the 100th anniversary of Rerum Novarum, which was by Pope John Paul II, is that mm -hmm. the popes are trying to find a way to avoid the errors on the one side of socialism and government control of the means of production and the, and the, and the destruction of liberty that comes in the wake of that. That's on the one side. But then on the other side, uh, the kind of capitalism that creates plutocracy. Absolutely. Uh, that where, where people can use wealth uh, to squeeze out competitors, to uh, get control of an economic situation so that they can engage in exploitation. One of the things that the popes urge is trying to find ways for workers to participate not only in the management of businesses, where their voices are heard, which will benefit businesses as well as workers themselves, but also find ways that workers can have equity participation, especially in larger firms. And I think that is a very good direction to try to go in. Mm -hmm. When workers mm -hmm. are part owners of firms, that Absolutely. can only benefit the firms and it certainly benefits the, uh, the workers. I'd much rather see us move in that direction than government control, than a socialist direction. This is where we learn from our Scandinavians, Scandinavian brothers and sisters. Norway, the opposite and the great legacy that goes with Norway is the same as with Finland and others, where you actually got workers on the board. So when fundamental decisions are made in regard to the destiny of the enterprise, the workers' voices have some weight. They have some substance. Michael Harrington and the others tried to push that in the 1980s, uh, and it didn't, didn't go too far. But I think right now we're living in a moment in which there is a crony capitalism at work. There is an oligopoly and a monopoly that's running things. But it's shifted. It's no longer industrial-based. It's bank 
it's in the banking industry. and technology. It's in te- so, technology and banking. So you Google, see. Facebook, firms, firms like this, and and, and, that, and that Wall creates, Street creates, connection to Silicon Valley. It's a very intimate relation. They have to go right ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah. Well, I was just thinking of yeah. um, of the, um, the 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 civil liberties problems that are created when you have essentially a kind of uh, new public square uh, in the form of uh, platforms like. Uh, Facebook, uh, mm-hmm. where people uh, should be able to interact uh, freely, but it's a private, for-profit uh, business, which is fine. I have no problem with that. Uh, and yet, if Facebook can exercise a lot of control over what is said, if it can engage in effect in censorship, then how sure. far have we That's really respected right. civil liberties? A, a monopoly or an oligopoly has now placed itself in the position, functionally, of government exercising uh, uh, censorship. And I know that there are a lot of uh, conservatives who are, who are now very concerned, very worried uh, about cases in which the conservative point of view has been censored from places like Facebook. And it's probably happening to people with other perspectives as well. I, of course, I'm m- much more likely to hear it from conservatives. But that seems to me a genuine worry if you've got a case of monopoly or oligopoly. Now, if you have a truly competitive marketplace, things will take care of themselves. The business will gravitate uh, to where uh, the free flow of information can uh, can occur, but we don't have that with firms like Google and Facebook and Absolutely. so forth. You have monopoly and oligopoly now, and yeah, I think absolutely. that's going to be a challenge a for, uh, for, challenge. for us going forward. I got my dear brothers Glenn Ford and the other Black Agenda report saying that look, it's almost it's nearly impossible for radical voices to have a deep rootage and anchorage when it comes to the public square, which is very much driven by these private companies, you see. And that's going to be a problem. Why? Because, I mean, one of the fundamental questions, this is a great question, Lorraine Hansberry, one of the finest artists, 20th century, she says, how do you bequeath to the younger generation the best visions, examples of courage, individual and collective, to the younger generation? Because without those milestones in the past, without us connecting to those milestones in the past, all they have to go on is the chaos of the present. And the present is all about money, spectacle, status. That's the neoliberal soul craft. And I say neoliberal because it's not just political. It's spiritual, it's moral, and it tells young people the end and aim of life is to be successful in terms of material wealth, power and military might, it says very little about greatness in terms of the quality of their spirits and the quality of their moral character. You see. And that is the death knell of any civilization, because no civilization can survive if it loses sight of the rich examples of those who came before, who bequeathed to them a moral and spiritual, spiritual heritage, not just a great example of success when it comes to money, status, and power. Can I say a word about this? Mm -hmm. Because this is a point on which I uh, fundamentally agree with Cornell. Let me put it this way. Mm -hmm. We've got a wonderful form of government. Our constitutional um, system, the Madisonian uh, system, uh, has shown that you can make a republic work. That was an open question in 1776 and 1789 and 1791, whether republican government could work because it had been tried in many places before in the ancient world, in the medieval and renaissance worlds, uh, and, and, and failed, and failed. Mm-hmm. Uh, we've got a wonderful system of republican government. We've got a wonderful constitutional system. I, I, I'd like us to be more faithful to it. I think we've often deviated when we well, shouldn't have. Well, we've got large got deviations great, with indigenous peoples and slavery and so forth. To go we've, right got, we've, got a great, uh-huh. we've got a great system. I think our, the market system is a good system. If, if, if we can push out the crony capitalism and really get a market to work as a competitive uh, uh, thing so that, uh, so that we get the benefits of better goods and services at lower prices, the market does its work of improving quality and uh, reducing costs, that's a great thing. But in the long run, you cannot sustain either Republican government or the market economy, which are great benefits to our people, if you do not have a moral foundation. And that moral foundation doesn't just happen. That spiritual formation, that moral formation, that sound understanding of what matters in life, what it means to be a human being, what our obligations to others are, the market won't produce that for you. Nor will the system of government produce that for you. If it's going to be produced for you, it will be by the family. 
and the institutions of civil society, of religion, neighborhood, and civic association that assist the family in its role as the basic transmitter of values, of character to each new generation. And we need to protect those institutions of civil society because beginning with the family, they really are the, the primordial department of health, education, and welfare. Mm -hmm. They do more than just mm -hmm. diaper the kids and get them mm -hmm. fed and off to school and, and so forth. They form them as the kinds of human beings they will be. That's what I mean by being transmitters of, uh, of, of values. So look, the economy, the market system, and our Republican form of government both depend on something that neither can produce and that is reasonably virtuous, decent, honorable citizens who can be good citizens of the republic, who can be good participants in the, in the market. They can't produce them, they rely on something else to do that. Like an Irene and Clifton West. Ooh, that's true. That's very that's true. Absolutely right. Very much so. When you talk about mom and dad, we can talk about his parents, talk about your parents. You're talking about persons who have been shaped by what the Isaac brothers call a caravan of love. The love of truth, the love of justice, the love of neighbor. And as Christians, we love our enemies, but you don't try that on your own. You need a whole lot of thick grace for that. And a love of the holy for those who are religion. I, granted, I think there's a whole host of atheistic and agnostic brothers and sisters who have great spirituality and moral character, sometimes even more than, than we Christians. So I don't believe that a love of holy is a prerequisite for being a person of integrity. I know people of great integrity who don't believe in God. But as a Christian myself, uh, I know that I, I, I cannot preserve my sanity without viewing myself as part of a great tradition of a hated people who taught the world much of how to love. And when you look at the history of the American Republic, for example, what would have happened to the United States if instead of Frederick Douglass and Harriet Tubman, you had black versions of the Klan. What would happen to America if in the 1960s you didn't have Martin Luther King Jr., Fannie Lou Hamer, but you had a black version of the Klan? So when they kill the four girls in Birmingham, your response is to kill four white girls on the vanilla side of town. It was spiritual and moral character of black people that constituted the leaven for the American democratic loaf. There would have been a civil war every generation if you had these absolutely right. terrorist terrors of black people. If we had black ISIS, or black versions of ISIS, let's say in America, there'd be no American democracy because you can't keep track of all of us. But no, it was a moral, spiritual tradition that produced Irene Cliff, my brother Cliff, my sister Cynthia Sherrill, Lord Rodney when I was a little and a gangster. I always tell I was a gangster <laughs> before I met Jesus. And now I'm a gangster with uh, I'm a redeemed sinner with gangster proclivity. But I still got gangster proclivity. And, and I need people to keep me in place. You know what I mean? Right wing brothers, left wing brothers, whatever it is. My loved ones and what have you. But the important thing is, Robbie's point is the linchpin. If you lose that moral and spiritual heritage, you have a war of all against all. And for Symmachus, triumphs over Socrates. Might makes right. You impose coercion. Of tremendous violence as opposed to a love, a justice, a dialogue, a democracy, an attempt of some kind of civilized society. And we're, we're, we're reaching the point where we're running out of gas. We're running out of spiritual and moral gas in the United States. In the 40s and 50s and 60s, it was not a foregone conclusion uh, that uh, the, the way forward uh, that uh, uh, African Americans would adopt would be the peaceful one of Martin Luther, oh, Luther King. That's there was true. Elijah Muhammad, there was the early Malcolm X before his own uh, conversion to uh, an orthodox form of Islam, uh, and many others who were pointing yeah, in, a, in, a, in, a, in another yeah. direction, a more a radical, violent... Well, you just uh, had the soldiers coming back fighting a thug called his, Hitler, yeah. his racism, then you come back to, to racist America, Jim yeah. Crow, and I mean, we know the story in terms of the double victory that A. Philip Randolph was calling but for I, racism in Europe. Racism in America. We crushed the thugs in Europe, thank God, with the help of black and white soldiers together and the help of the Soviet Army. We come back home, these black soldiers treated like second class citizens, all of them in uniform. But see. what made that possible, I want to suggest, mm -hmm. what made it possible for African Americans to opt for the path of Martin Luther King 
was the black church. That yeah, culture that's true. That's true. that produced Irene and Clifton West that's true. was sustained by the black church over all those decades and decades and Absolutely. centuries of slavery and Jim Crow Absolutely. and, no, and, that's and depression. And, and I think you know, people these days forget that. They forget the role that the black church played in sustaining uh, African Americans and making it possible for us to make the progress that we have made. And, and as much credit as Martin Luther King deserves, it's not just Martin Luther King. It's not something that happened starting in 1961 or 1959 or 1965. Right. This was sustained over generations Absolutely. in black And I would churches. add just one footnote to that, and this is where we get to the music. Because I think the black musical tradition is one of the, if not the greatest tradition in the modern world of moral and spiritual fortitude. And by fortitude, I mean diffusion of courage and magnanimity, courage and greatness of character. Because courage could be, I said, you can have a Nazi soldier who's courageous and still a gangster. But when you have courage and greatness of character, so that the music that came out of the black church, so that the Ray Charles and, and, and the Aretha Franklins and the Marvin Gaye's and the dramatics and the whispers and the main ingredient, they were no longer always Christians, but the music that they were producing was still shot through with a love ethic that kept track of the humanity of others. So like James Baldwin, who leaves the church, but the love ethic never leaves him. And the black music has played a fundamental role in humanizing our relations with each other, much of it rooted in the black church, but not always tied to the dogma of the black church. I mean, John Coltrane's love supreme doesn't fit into Christian dogma, but it sure fits into Christian love. And that has played a crucial role in allowing vanilla brothers and sisters to say, lo and behold, these people have an intelligence, a creativity, imagination, and a genius that speaks to my soul. So white supremacy might be a lie. Even though it's alive, it might be a lie. Now, you hear this brother play the guitar, <laughs> and he plays serious guitar now. Oh, Robert, Brother Robbie can play some guitar. Very much so. He understands the role of music that flows from the church, but also flows outside of the church. But that love ethic is still informing that music. You get in Bruce Springsteen. He's a blues vanilla brother to the core. He's connected to the black church to the degree to which the black music that is rooted in what he does coming from the white side of town and doing it in his own way fascinating relation to this spiritual stuff that we need in order to go forward. In your autobiography, Brother West, you refer to yourself frequently as a bluesman. Oh, absolutely. What does that mean? But I'm first and foremost a blues man. A blues person is somebody whose personal narrative is shot through with catastrophe, but engages in lyrical expression of that catastrophe and it doesn't allow the hatred to have the last word. That's what blues is. B.B. King says, nobody loves me but my mama, and she might be driving too. <laughs> That's catastrophe at the highest level. That's like Antigone's and Sophocles' play. Oh. But how does he respond to catastrophe? With a smile, with style, with compassion, with his soul, emptying himself to connect to other people's soul, so that even when he's playing his guitar with Lucille, that's the name of his guitar, right? He's connecting on a human level to his audience, whatever color they are. But he's coming out of gut bucket, Jim Crow, Mississippi genius, saying this love ethic will not be stopped, mediated with this guitar, you see. And you can hear Robert Johnson, hear Bessie Smith, that tradition all through his music. And he's not the only one, but we can just begin with the king of BB. You can talk about Bessie Smith, Ma Rainey. You can talk about a Charlie Parker. You can talk about a Stevie Wonder, whoever. And the, the role of music, I mean, I believe that the artists are the vanguard of the species and that the musicians are the vanguard of the artists. But when your music gets commodified, when your music gets marketized and no longer has moral and spiritual substance like so much music today, you know that the spiritual crisis is intensifying. All right, we've spent an hour talking. We're going to get our callers involved. But is this at 
all similar to what your classes were like? <laughs> yeah, I think that's, <laughs> that's right. True. I mean, the difference is we usually have a text. Though. We have uh, yeah, Augustus' yeah, Confessions, yeah. we got Plato's Republic, we got Sophocles, Du Bois. Sophocles, Antigone. Du Bois. Just, yeah, just, that's true. We just got referred Antigone, to Sophocles, Antigone. Antigone. You referred Souls to black Sim folk, Simicus yeah. earlier? Of that's right. She's a character that's right. in uh, Plato's Republic. Republic. Yeah. Those are, so we have texts that we're bouncing off. Right now, we, we yeah. have each other. Yeah. Uh, and, and yourself, thank God. But uh, but in a classroom, you know, we, we've got to deal with subject matter with the, that the text provide. How much would this have cost to attend this class? <laughs> Gosh, Princeton and Harvard, I think the uh, I think the the tuition and fees now are well over sixty thousand dollars. Am I yeah, right? Uh, yeah, now, of course, they're very, because of generous donors to these universities and the big endowments that they've been able to build, which is a big issue now about whether those endowments should be taxed. Uh, but because of that, there are very generous financial aid uh, packages. So large yeah. percentages of our students, uh, I believe now we're well over a majority, uh, certainly at Princeton, I believe this is mm. true at Harvard, mm. uh, are receiving some financial aid, and many, many of them are receiving large financial aid packages. In, uh, I think, a fair number of cases, uh, it ends up being cheaper for a student to go to Harvard or Princeton than it would be to go to his home state university or one of his home state mm. universities because of the generous financial aid that's, uh, mm. that's available. The problem, of course, is that there are a limited number of spaces at these universities uh, and the competition for one of those spaces is extremely uh, intense. So places like Princeton and Harvard are only admitting 5, 5 or 6 percent of the, of the students who, yeah. uh, who apply. Absolutely. As notable professors on these campuses, are you encouraged to fundraise? Not really, no. No, generally not. Really? I began uh, I, I began becoming a fundraiser, and I am one now. I do a lot of fundraising now. When Princeton uh, uh, authorized me to found a program called the James Madison Program in American Ideals and Institutions, that was back in, uh, in 2000, so we're in the 17th, 17th year. Years. And this is a program. Uh, Brother Cornell was wow. a fellow of our wow. program uh, uh, a year before, year before last. Uh, uh, this, uh, this center, this program, uh, builds on uh, Princeton's historic strength in areas like um, political philosophy, constitutional law, uh, American history, to try to enrich our students' uh, understandings of American ideals and institutions, and the broader civilizational uh, 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 structures that made possible uh, the American founding. Now, uh, because uh, when I founded the Madison program, the university made clear that while they would assist with fundraising, we would not be given an annual allocation of money from the university's central account. Uh, I have to raise the money each year for the, uh, the program, and we're now up to uh, over a $2 million annual budget. So I have to, I have to be out there yeah, raising whole, the money. Uh, our, our development office is very helpful at Princeton. I'm very grateful to them for helping me. We have uh, some uh, generous alumni who support us. We have foundations uh, who support us. Uh, so because of that particular uh, unusual circumstance for me, uh, I have become a fundraiser. But Princeton didn't put any pressure on me to do that. Yeah. I wanted to do something. I wanted to do something new. Uh, I wanted to uh, introduce as a model, I hope for other universities, uh, a, a program that, that would enrich our students' understanding of basic American constitutional and moral uh, principles, and that ended up making me a fundraiser. I've met a lot of wonderful people uh, this way. It's a, it's a and, burden, and I have to tell you. It's a burden well, you, but to you, fundraise. But you're, but you're, but you're, 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 you're charming people. things help yeah. facilitate oh, warm yeah. relations. <laughs> and, and I've been very blessed to be be a fellow. Now, it, again, just for the audience, you know, it's, he's got fellows who don't have economic support. I was part of the fellow because I was teaching in the freshman seminar, and he was open enough to be able to jointly support that seminar. But in terms, because you got some fellows who receive financial That's support exactly right. and so forth, you got mm -hmm. some fellows who are just glad to be there, and I'm glad to be there because I, uh, I'm just in there for the dialogue. So and we contributed it, the course that Cornell taught. So the Madison program funded in Princeton University, the course that it was a freshman it was seminar. The freshman yeah. seminar itself that is taught at the university itself. But you can see, you see, I am not the ideal person to go out and raise money for an elite institution because I love to be part of the conversation. But a lot of times, my critiques can be so intense that they say to themselves, "We're not really sure that this public face is the most effective." in terms of being able to raise money. Now, sometimes they do if they have a broad perspective. If they're committed to 
a robust, uninhibited conversation, then I think we might be able to get yeah. some contributors. But a lot of times they say, well, I, I think a money. lot this of people certainly might be too radical to be raising money for well to do. I, I mean, when I was on the Guggenheim, one of the conditions I had was that they supported the Learning Through the Arts program. And went Marcellus and myself had to make sure that poor children throughout Harlem and other places had access to the instruments. So you come into these big institutions concerned about the weak and the vulnerable and ensure that these institutions are attending to what they're about. And so in that sense, I, I, I wouldn't mind. But I think generally speaking, they probably hold off on me, though. It's a very interesting experience that I've had because uh, when it comes even to my fundraising for the Madison program at Princeton, mm -hmm. uh, our donors, almost universally, uh, including our conservative donors, and many of our donors are themselves politically conservative, uh, have counted it very much in favor of the program that Cornell and I do the work that we do together. Mm -hmm. I got not mm -hmm. a single complaint from a donor or anybody else about our sponsoring Cornell's course last year and making uh, him a fellow. And that, and that was on uh, Martin King and Abraham Joshua Heschel. Exactly two great right. prophetic figures. And that's true. That's and and true. the work that Cornell and I do both that's at Princeton true. and around the country together, uh, I find that supporters of the Madison program are just enthusiastic about that. This is what mm -hmm. they want to see. They want to see the civil but robust mm -hmm. engagement well, I think that's of true. I ideas. Think they want to see people working together true. across all yeah. sorts of different yeah. lines. Yeah. Including. But we'd have to be together, I think. If, I, I'm not sure they would invite me all by myself. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That'd be a different kind of, and yeah. it's understandable, you know, because the left wing not inviting you by yourself. Yeah, we uh, you know, we, we, we had an experience we, we, we uh, last year when uh, we spoke at the American Enterprise Institute. Yes, uh, yes. Uh, together it was wonderful, and as we were walking out, Brother Cornell uh, it, and we were treated so graciously and oh, so and wonderfully. Was it Brother it was Arthur? And Brother Arthur uh, Brooks. Yes. Uh, and uh, as we were walking out, Cornell said to me, "Brother Robbie, I have to say, I'm not sure that a, a progressive think tank would have." treated you as well as I have been treated here. Now, I, I hope that's not true, but uh, yeah, I don't know. I we haven't, we haven't tested but that. But I, I do wonder. I do wonder. <laughs> that's very true. But when you have money and power and privilege, it might be easier to treat somebody nice as opposed to folk who basically are pushed against the wall right now. The left is so weak, you know, we're so feeble right I, now. I don't see it that way. I, I see it yeah. the opposite way. Well, no, but the, 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 the liberals, so the liberals powerful. are powerful, but oh, not the left. You mean the... Uh, yeah, you yeah, see the liberals. Yeah. We don't want to confuse liberals yeah. and the left now. Oh, not at all. These liberals are tied to Wall Street and imperial expansion and drone strikes and surveillance and national security state in ways that we have to be very critical of. Gentlemen, we're going to get our callers involved. They're on hold. We're going to begin with a call from a woman named E in Suitland, Maryland. E, you are on with Cornell West and Robert George. Go ahead. We're listening. I would like to call this a true spiritual serendipity. I just came out of prayer about an hour ago, and everything seems to fit. The only question I'd like for you to focus on is what do you think of disavowing uh, being in the Republican and or Democratic parties and file as independent with a more spiritual, truly spiritual stance? And I do and have we're going to let uh, court, you know what, we're going to leave it there and we're going to let Cornell West answer. Robert George, if you'd flip the switch on your box, oh, yeah, yeah, that yeah. should uh, turn yeah. on your audio. Not that one. Don't turn that one. And Garrett will come in and take care of that in just a minute. So, oh, Cornell West, if you want to answer that caller, we'll, we'll figure that out, uh, Professor George. Go ahead. Well, Professor. one, I just want to thank you for your own spirit in terms of uh, resonating with what we're trying to convey. Um, but as we know, I mean, spirit can go in so many different directions. And I, I'm just concerned that when we talk about spirituality, that it's tied very much to social justice for the most vulnerable in our society, no matter who they are, vulnerable in the world. And therefore, when it comes to choosing which particular political party, I think we ought to look at the world through the lens of the most vulnerable. As a Christian, for me, that's what it means to look at the world through the lens of the cross, or for Amos, when he talked about looking at his own society through the lens of those who were suffering. Uh, and that could easily lead toward you being an independent. Very much so. I think that could, that could be a sign of a certain kind of integrity because I think both of our political parties are just shot through with levels of myopia and cowardice and tied to big money that is so sad and so disempowering. 
So I think we need more independence. But again, the choice is up to you. I don't believe in dictating anybody's choice. And next up is Ron in Babylon, New York. Oh. Ron, good afternoon. We are here, listening right? to you. Please go I'll ahead. See here. Yeah, I respect the uh, values of love and caring for others uh, and the uh, liberation of self and, and the concern for others. So I think that's something that I really respect and think both you gentlemen uh, have talked about and, and uh, are champions of. The question that I have is you also have the principles of um, our country and beliefs in our country and the way the country was set up. And part of that is the Congress. And part of that Congress is the, the actual uh, compromise of the Congress, say the current tax bill. There's some good things and some bad things in that tax bill. How does that deal with the ideal of morality and love when indeed the road that we're on is an incremental, incremental road and a growth road and compromise sometimes has some bad elements in it? So I have a question in that area. Thank you very much. Um, Robert George, the only part of that you missed was her kind comments about this discussion, yeah. but then she went on to talk about the tax bill. Cornell West, if you'd like to start. Well, no, I think Brother Robert should no, jump in on that. You sure? No, I think the tax bill is a colossal failure when it comes to issues of morality and spirituality tied to the vulnerable. There's no doubt about it. You start slashing uh, uh, corporate rates for tax, corporate corporations are able to hire these very, very smart lawyers to create loopholes already. They got offshore tax havens already, and now you're going to slice it with it from 3091 and take it all the way down to 20. I don't believe that the conservative argument often put forward, not by all conservatives, but many, that if you slash the taxes of the rich, that somehow that's going to generate economic growth that will have an uplift for the most vulnerable. I do not see evidence of that, uh, and I hear it over and over again. So I do uh, uh, resonate with what you said initially about our concern about the vulnerable. If you look at our tax, this particular tax bill through the lens of the vulnerable and the impact on them, it's a colossal failure. My own view is that we did need to uh, and do need to uh, cut mm -hmm. corporate taxes mm -hmm. to make our own uh, businesses more competitive. Uh, we have among, if not the highest, uh, corporate tax rates uh, in the world, and that has adverse consequences for uh, American workers. Uh, this is a classic case of watching the sausage being made, watching, uh, watching mm -hmm. legislation is like watching sausage being made. And yes, there are lots of uh, compromises that are made, and some of them are very unfortunate. Uh, I have a worry. It was the worry that caused uh, uh, Senator Corker from Tennessee to vote against the bill uh, in the Senate, which is that we're further expanding uh, the deficit. We're not dealing with uh, spending uh, with spending uh, issues. Uh, I, I think a lot of uh, ordinary people will get a small tax cut. Uh, a lot of wealthy people will get a much larger uh, tax cut. Uh, taxes will go up for some uh, wealthy people, not for uh, others. It's going to be a complicated situation, but at the end of the day, I don't think what we will have is fundamental change. Mm. Uh, mm. I don't see this as a big breakthrough, and I don't see it as a big catastrophe. It'll shift a few things uh, around, but it's not fundamental change. What I would like to see is a rethinking of the whole system, but that means tackling mm. something that nobody wants to tackle, and that is the spending side. Also, uh, and, and here I'm going to introduce uh, uh, an issue that uh, one almost never hears about these days, there's also the issue on the monetary uh, side. We have had artificially low interest rates for a very, very long time, perhaps an unprecedentedly large time. I'm not sure about that, but it's certainly in my lifetime. Uh, we've never had such a period of, uh, of very, very low interest rates, and of course that's the work of of, uh, of, of the Fed. There are winners and losers as a, uh, mm. as a result of that. Mm. And we don't pay nearly enough uh, attention to monetary mm. policy. And I think there really should be a serious, robust debate about that. But again, it's, it's, it's not happening. So I, I think what we're getting in this tax bill at the end of the day, after all the sturm and drang and all the dramatic speeches by the senators on both sides and so forth, is not a lot of change, just some relatively yes, minor right. Uh, rearrangements and the reform that we need is not happening. And, and both sides agree, Steele, that for every $53, 53 cents out of a dollar, 
goes to the military. So yeah. that when it comes to serious interrogation and accountability of the military industrial complex, very little talk coming out of either party. And that's tied to our adventurism. That's tied to our foreign policy that oftentimes does not have financial accountability to public interest. Well, I'm a person who believes in a strong military, as you know, but, but we, a, a, a military has got, got to, be to be subject accountable. to the same right rules of accountability as Absolutely. everybody else. I mean, too often it's just easy to say, I've increased military spending, vote for me. I've made our nation stronger. Uh, vote for and me. that money is taken, and yeah. you don't have to, money for schools of quality and jobs with a living wage and decent housing and so forth. Yeah. Let's hear from Barbara in Oak Bluffs, Massachusetts. Good afternoon, Barbara. Hi, thank you. Um, whoever said one in one doesn't make three has never encountered this particular roadshow here. Um, absolutely <laughs> thrilling, um, thrilling conversation. I learned that MIT put their entire curriculum online years ago, and I would like to ask these two to get this freshman seminar uh, filmed online for PBS or um, uh, NPR, it could be radio, it could be a podcast, just get C-Spin? it out here, okay? <laughs> um, the the obvious power of this partnership is so extraordinary, and it's almost like lef- a left-brain, right-brain partnership, because um, Brother West is so warm, and Brother Other is so cool, and yet the <laughs> words and the ideas are, you know, Brother where it's other. at. <laughs> one more thing, one more thing. It's very important that we use memes, M-E-M-E-S, um, intelligently now in this social media age, okay? And um, I tuned in at 10 after 12, and I heard the word soul craft. And I'd never heard that, and obviously, you know, it's an invention of Brother West here, I think, or both of them together. But for me, I... To me, the better meme to focus on is integrity, okay? Because integrity is is ahistorical. In other words, it's, it's not connected to religion. It doesn't have that... You know, I don't want to badmouth soul because of that magnificent thing that you did on the music and all that. It's true. But but for this younger generation, I'm 70, okay? I'm a Reformed Jew. I, I'm an intellectual. But we have to understand that we aren't going to be here much longer, and we have to figure out how to communicate this moral integrity thing to this next generation. It's not their fault Barbara, that they were born thank you. into We're going to leave culture. it there, and we're going to hear from Brother West and Brother Robert. Brother Other. Or brother Other, that's it. I missed it already. Well, I want to thank our, uh, our caller for that, uh, kind, uh, that kind comment. Um, my own uh, large undergraduate course, or one of my large undergraduate courses, uh, which is a course in civil liberties, is going to um, uh, go online fairly soon. We're going to do uh, the first online uh, version of that starting, uh, starting this spring. So this is an experiment uh, for me. I've been looking at what some other scholars have done, including our friend Michael Sandel, who's done it at Harvard with his course on justice, his wonderful course on justice, and done it very successfully. So uh, I'm hoping to to make that work for my civil liberties course. But a seminar is a different thing, and it's a very special thing. Cornell and I have wrestled with uh, the question of whether uh, we should uh, make our seminar more public. For example, we've had a lot of uh, reporters who've asked to sit in on the seminar and do an article about it or do a clip about it on a, a newscast or something like that. And we have, in the end, always decided no. Now, why have we decided no? When someone is in there watching and reporting, or when you're online, or when you're doing it as mm-hmm. an online course, the students know that they're on display. The beauty of a seminar uh, is that people, knowing that they're not on display, are willing to experiment with ideas, to speak their minds, to try a thought out, Mm. even if it uh, might turn out that it's uh, not going to work and uh, might even be embarrassing. Uh, So to try to preserve the intimacy of the uh, the seminar, to try to uh, make sure students do not feel as though they're on display, in that format we've opted uh, against any broader uh, involvement of people. Uh, in the seminar, trying to make it more widely available. It's a shame because there's such magic in the seminar. We would love to uh, share it, but we just haven't been able to find a way to do that. Now, we could shift to a different format. Mm. We could do Mm. a big lecture course together. But I'll let the viewers in on a little secret. 
you get two big mouth show offs in a classroom <laughs> in a lecture context in front of six, eight hundred students. <laughs> you're you're going to lose some of the magic that you get. <laughs> what is going to give him for? No, it's true. Now, Roberto Unger, who is one of the towering uh, figures at Harvard, yeah. and critical theorists at Harvard Law, where yeah. Brother Robbie also teaches. He and I teach a course at the law school called American Democracy, and we put each lecture on YouTube. And he's been doing this for a long time. But that's the case where yeah. you have two persons who give lectures, very little exchange because by the time we're done, the class is over. So you miss that Socratic element, that dialogical moment that's so very, very important that Brother Ravi and I just revel in because we learn so much from each other and we're empowered yeah, by each right. other. And the students are able to, to, to feel that energy ricocheting off our interaction. But I love what my dear sister said from Oak Bluff because uh, Oak Bluff's a very special place. That's on Martha's Vineyard, isn't it? That's a very mm -hmm. special mm -hmm. place. Yeah, I think that's a chocolate section of, uh, of Martha's Vineyard where a whole lot of high quality black folk uh, live and come to terms. So our, our Jewish sister here is uh, in good company and they're in good company too. She but raised in them. terms of soul craft, though, when, when I talked about the eclipse of integrity, honesty, decency, generosity, She's absolutely right that when we talk about soul craft as a fancy term, and I didn't make it up, Ribe didn't make it up, this goes all the way back to Plato, goes all the way back to medieval social theorists and political theorists all the way through our modern time. But the issue of integrity, honesty, decency, generosity, courage, fortitude, magnet, magnanimity, all these need to ju just not be talked about. But people have to see it exemplified, yeah. enacted, on the ground, day by day, grin by grin, touch by touch. Laugh by laugh, movement by movement. Uh, our caller raises a very, very important uh, uh, question. I'd like mm, to explore sure, a little sure, bit. Sure, um, sure. Could we jettison religion uh, or relegate it to the purely personal sphere and in our public discussions just talk in terms of things like integrity apart from oh. religion and dismiss talk about the soul? Uh, I've heard this suggestion mm. before, and I know a mm. lot of good people believe it. I cannot persuade myself that it is correct. I think if we go down that route, what we will be doing basically is spending down the capital of our great religious traditions, especially in, of course, in our culture, the Jewish and Christian traditions, spending down the capital without replenishing it. So yes, mm. I, I agree mm. with Brother Cornell, and mm. I know from firsthand experience that uh, one need not be a religious believer in order to be right. a person of integrity. There's no That's question right. about that. That's right. But can we sustain a culture of integrity? Can we defend these ideals? Can we make them meaningful for people, including our young people? She's right to focus on our young people. They're our future. Can we do all that by cutting off the roots, by going silent about religion? Do we have a way of defending our ideas of honor and integrity on the basis of a purely materialistic metaphysic or an idea of man, of the human, as mere material forces, as, as in, a, in a world exclusively made up of uh, efficient and uh, material causation, where there's no soul, where there's no uh, uh, sense of, of a person as more than merely the mm. material? Mm. I'm dubious about this. I have very grave doubts uh, about this. John Adams famously said, our Constitution is for a moral and religious people and will not serve well any other kind of people. That was not controversial in Adams' day. It's very controversial in our day. But even Adams knew that there were people who were skeptical about religion who were honorable people. Oh, sure. What he was sure. doubting is what I'm doubting, whether you can cut these concepts of integrity and decency and honor off from their religious roots in our culture or relegate them to the merely personal and still, and still mm. sustain them mm. in the face of the natural human desires to gratify one's own uh, needs, to put oneself first, uh, to uh, uh, favor uh, oneself and one's comfort over others, to seek honor and glory and fame and power and, and, and influence. How do you fight back against all that yeah. if we yeah. cut off the roots of our basic understandings of 
moral that's, concept. And that's, 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 that's my worry. Tough. I mean, I think of the last word in uh, the other Adams, Henry Adams, is education, education of Henry Adams, that valedictory word, shudder. Yes, exactly. What do you do with the death shudder? What do you do with the dread shudder? What do you do with the despair shudder? All of us shudder is like, like Faust in the realm of the mothers in Gertrude. Yeah, yeah. Faust, that, uh, that to be human is to shudder, to shudder in the face of knowing you are on the way to extinction in terms of your body, to knowing that you may be betrayed by friends, knowing that you may be trashed, misunderstood, and misconstrued, knowing you'll be lied on, rebuked, and scorned. And if religious narratives at their best allow us to come to terms with that shudder, you can't deny death. Yeah you escape and go to Disneyland, sooner or later you're going to have to leave Main Street or Orlando, come on back to your street and live your life. So if you work through that shudder and try to generate some spiritual possibilities of learning how to love, learning how to have, take risks, learning how to be vulnerable, learning how to have a certain kind of openness to others. And without those religious narratives as a species, we know that they've been crucial. But on the other hand, we also know that we're living in very, very secular times and, and that, uh, uh, you know, there's a debate between T.S. Eliot. You can't make it without the religious tradition. Here comes Chekhov saying, not only some of the best people I know are not religious, but religion has gotten in the way. It has promoted the hatred of Jews. It has promoted the hatred of non-Christians. It has promoted yeah, the hatred of yeah. Muslims with, 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 the, uh, with, with, the, with the various crusades and so on. So how do you wrestle with that set of issues in an honest way and it's a tough one it's a tough one you know we can make a case we can we can put things in terms of the dignity of the human being as a right. as a creature that is capable of rationality and freedom of the will if we continue right. to believe in those things right but even stated in that way uh, it lacks the, the the compellingness of the hebraic of concept the religious that the human stories. being is made in the very image and likeness mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. of god of the of the of the supreme judge and ruler uh, of 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 the universe, having a transcendent significance, mm -hmm. something that mm -hmm. goes beyond the merely material, beyond mm -hmm. the the here and now. Now, I mean, if in fact the truth is that human beings are just atoms, molecules in motion, just atoms of no more significance than than a than, than a rat or an ant, then we have to face that truth and do the best that we can with it. But, but you, you, can not have, you can have transcendence, you can though, without the religious, though. I mean, well, you can have, tra I'm not sure about that. You can have transcendence beauty, without... Beauty, democracy, friendship. You can have rich friendship that transcends individuals among seculars that takes no persons outside of themselves that is transcended in that sense. But can you give an account of that on purely material... If all human beings are, mm -hmm. is material stuff, yeah. no greater significance than a rat or an ant, you can give no account of why human beings should treasure friendship, should nurture mm -hmm. friendship, should never betray a friend, should make sacrifices for a friend, should, mm -hmm. should have integrity even at great cost, should be willing to mm -hmm. sacrifice themselves, but even the thing be is, martyrs but, for but great But you causes. can ascribe significance to friendship even if you believe human beings are nothing but these bundle of molecules in the relationship without necessarily referring to an external God. All that is to do is to not ask the question, how is this possible? Well, or to assume that there's no answer it's to It's just the secular is, source. It's a secular, it's, it's yeah, a secular well, source. It's a pagan think, think source. Can, the, think it's Aristotle, it's Lucretius, it's Lucian, oh, yeah. it's... Even Mark Twain ends up very atheistic, but he's a spiritual being in his deep way. Living but, off the capital. But he's living off living the capital, off the and capital. It's, it's rhetorical and metaphorical rather than uh, any yeah. claim of substance. But yeah. But now, now as you know, I'm a natural law theorist. Oh, I, so I, I, I know. I, 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 I believe you know, we can I'm, make... a, I'm a gut bucket Christian, so yeah. that uh, I'm just trying to think the strongest position against my own position. Which is the right way to handle it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Tell you what, let's interrupt that, and let's hear from <laughs> Beck in Inglewood, California. Hi, Beck. Hi, how are you? Thank you for taking my call, Professor George and Professor West. Here is the bigger picture. I'm very concerned regarding a potential military conflict between the United States and North Korea. Here is the exact question. Can you identify any person or any group of people that may have an acceptable level of integrity and moral character to carefully 
and peacefully guide us away from any potential conflict that can affect not just the United States but the entire world. I'll hang up and I'll uh, wait for the answer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Beck. Gentlemen? Mm. It's a very serious, very yes. serious question. Serious uh, question. Administration after administration has tried to come up with a way of dealing with North Korea um, and with the dictators of North Korea. Uh, all have failed. Um, will President Trump do any better? Well, we can only hope so, but, but so far it doesn't look like he's going to do any better. Uh, may do worse. Uh, yeah. This is yeah. a grave... This yeah. is a grave uh, situation. We have very little control. Uh, all we have been able to do so far is to put pressure on China, to That's put pressure on North Korea. Uh, that assumes that China is in a position to put pressure on North Korea. We like to believe that, and to some extent I think that is true, uh, but I think it's limited. Uh, there's also the question of China's will to put pressure uh, on North Korea. Mm -hmm. That's very dubious uh, uh, to me. Uh, I wish I had a solution back. I wish I uh, knew what to do. Yeah, yeah, I can think of I can I can think of people I would trust uh, uh, to manage the most difficult of, of 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 situations. I have my own favorite people in uh, politics, uh, but it would be an enormous challenge for uh, for anybody. And so far, the record of administrations, Republican or Democrat, liberal and conservative, has been a record of failure. No, it's true. You, That's, you no, it's that just, it's yeah. a fundamental. Query. I mean, I wish that um, you know, President Trump had more of the poise and diplomatic maturity that we saw in President Obama. And I'm not no, one I mean, who's been uncritical of President Obama. I'll go at him tooth and nail. But when it comes to his diplomatic maturity and the use of language and ways in which you try to lower the temperature, because this is an all or nothing matter, just a matter of pushing buttons. And lo and behold, we're in a completely different time and space and zone here. So that the kind of uh, childish narcissism that you get in the hyperbolic rhetoric of President Trump as opposed to the more mature diplomatic language of President Obama, you have to acknowledge that. And that might be a way of lowering the temperature, but it's not a direct answer to our dear sister's question because I don't know of a set of individuals who you could really trot out to help mediate this thing. I just don't know of any. You know, our, our only, um, uh, po the only possibility anybody's come up with is trying to work through China. China, that's true. That's exactly right. Maybe South Korea may have some secrets of, of having connections with the North on the down low and therefore be able to surface. But at the moment, we do not have an answer to that question. It's a crucial one in terms of impeding nuclear catastrophe. Cornell West, you met your first president in 1968. Who was it? My first president. 1968. He wasn't president at the time. Oh, well, I met uh, Ronald Reagan when my brother won state meet, when my brother <laughs> Clifton West won the state meet and the Golden West. He's the number one miler in the country. Went on UC Berkeley to set record. You, I can tell you. And, story oh, about I tell you, yeah, Ronald <laughs> Reagan. Uh, we got a chance to interact with that brother. He now he was a kind and gentle person. But I was very close to the Black Panther Party, very supportive of Angela Davis, upset with what he had done with Angela Davis, pushing her out of UCLA as professor of philosophy. And so we had a nice little dialogue about his, uh, his views about You were a teenager Black Panther. at the time. I was then uh, 14, 14. But, uh, but I've been raised by mom and dad to treat people kindly, even if I had deep ideological disagreements. Have you ever like met Donald around. Trump? Oh yeah, I met Donald Trump. Absolutely. No, I met Donald Trump years ago in uh, Atlantic City. and He was exactly the same way then. Narcissistic, insecure, all spectacle, very little substance, obsessed with being the smartest and the richest in the room. The problem was that he was one of the few white brothers in the room. So for the most part he had to keep his mouth shut. He was in there with Mike Tyson. Uh, uh, he had to keep his mouth shut because uh, we had a certain kind of predominance of style that pushed him to the margins, but you could tell that he still the same little, uh, not little, but the same person who just never grew up, never grew up, doesn't feel as if he has any accountability, responsibility, answerability, anything beyond himself. And I would have never thought, if somebody had told me then that he would be in the White House, I would have told him to get off the crack pipe. 
There's no way, there's no possibility that he would be elected by fellow citizens. And lo and behold, here we are in this mess. It's worth asking ourselves how, how that happened. happened. There's that's a true. lot that's of true. blame to go around. No, and the, no, the, the neglect of people who are the Trump uh, supporters is a big part of that story. Can I tell a story? This, uh, of course, uh, Brother Cornell met Ronald Reagan long before we knew, <laughs> we knew each other. But uh, I'll tell you a little story about it. So one of my brothers uh, happened to be at a reception where he met former President Bill Clinton. And he was telling me about this, my brother Keith. Brother Keith George Keith. from Charleston, West Virginia. Good and man, uh, good man. Uh, Keith, had, uh, Keith had had a little conversation with uh, former President Clinton. And so I asked Keith, well, how did, how did that go? Uh, uh, and Keith's strong conservative like myself. Uh, so he said, well, you know, what was interesting is that he was so warm and so engaging and when he talked to me, he made me feel as though I was the only person in the mm. room. Mm. And uh, so I was reporting this story to Cornell. I told it just as I yeah. told to you and our viewers right now. And I said, Brother Cornell, isn't it interesting these politicians, they have that ability. They, uh, they, they have this knack for talking to people and, and making people like them and, and make them f making people feel as though the politician is talking to them and that they're the most important person in the world. And uh, Cornell replied uh, saying, uh, well, uh, <laughs> said, uh, I've met Bill Clinton on numerous occasions and he's just faking it. <laughs> With Ronald Reagan, it was real. <laughs> well, Bill Clinton is a master at it. He's a master at it. There's no doubt about it. But uh, by, by being a master, he's able to appear in certain kind of certain kind of way. One of the things we like to do on In Depth is ask our guests who some of their influences are, what are some of their favorite books, what they're reading now. Here are the responses we got from Robert George and Cornell West. Here's a look at some of the best books of the year, according to Amazon. Edward Luce, chief U.S. columnist for the Financial Times, argues that liberal democracy is threatened in The Retreat of Western Liberalism. In The Last Castle, Denise Kiernan reports on Biltmore House, the largest private residence in American history. Tom Nichols, professor of national security affairs at the U.S. Naval War College, argues that due to the spread of the Internet and 24-hour news, Expert opinion is now being discounted in the death of expertise. 
Yuval Harari looks at the future of humanity in Homo Deus. And wrapping up our look at Amazon's best books of 2017 is BuzzFeed's Scotchy Cole's essays on her upbringing as a daughter of Indian immigrants in Canada. One day we'll all be dead and none of this will matter. In my eighth grade biology class, her teacher gave us a checklist of dominant versus recessive alleles to teach us how babies come out looking the way they do. The subtext from this particularly nationalistic teacher, clear to me only years later, was that we would all end up looking darker and more vague than we did in the past. She wasn't exactly unhappy about it, but she did express some concern regarding the eventual loss of the blue-eyed and natural blonde. We were paired up with someone of the opposite sex so we could compare genes to determine what our potential child would look like. Let me really drive this home. A public school teacher in suburban Calgary told her teenage students to pretend they were going to have sex with each other and bear biologically likely babies. I was one of the only ethnic kids in the class. My genes were already steamrolling everybody else's. My partner, Eric, a white boy who was a Hollister t-shirt personified, went down the genetic checklist with me. When we arrived at hair on fingers or knuckles, I looked down at my hands for what seemed like the very first time. Standing up from the meat of my fingers were soft black strands of hair. I was horrified. How had I never noticed such a grotesque feature? I always knew my legs were hairy, my arms covered, my upper lip bristled enough to catch flies. But I had overlooked this new barbarity. Well, I don't have any, Eric said, looking up at me while I hid my hands under the desk. I nodded and said, me neither. Some of these authors have appeared on Book TV. You can watch them on our website, booktv.org. I'll look now at some of the authors recently featured on Book TV's Afterwards, our weekly author interview program. Daily Caller News Foundation Editor-in-Chief Christopher Bedford explored the leadership skills of President Trump. FBI agent Tamar El Nuri detailed his experiences fighting terrorism as a Muslim American. And former Face the Nation host Bob Schieffer examined the role of the media today. In the coming weeks on Afterwards, Gold Star father Kizir Khan will recall his immigration to the United States and offer his thoughts on what it means to be an American. Christopher Scalia, son of the late Supreme Court Justice Antonin Scalia, will share selections from his father's speeches. And this weekend on Afterwards, best-selling author Jeanette Conant will report on the work of her grandfather, Manhattan Project scientist James Bryant Conant. There was a great fear that this weapon was so powerful that it could really destroy the world in the wrong hands, become something that terrorists could use. All of this was clearly envisioned by its creators um, really before the war was over and they began trying desperately to put in place some kind of international controls so that this weapon could not proliferate. You would not have people stockpiling and building nuclear weapons left, right and center. And so this meeting in Moscow in Christmas Eve was so crucial because uh, my grandfather and the Americans that went uh, were desperately hoping that they could convince Stalin and Molotov to agree to control the future of this terrible, terrible force. Um, they were very optimistic um, that it could still be done. Um, but by the time they left Moscow, uh, they were they were less convinced that the Russians really wanted to participate in, in these negotiations. Afterwards, airs on Book TV every Saturday at 10 p.m. Eastern and Sunday at 9 p.m. Eastern and Pacific. Here's a look at some books being published this week. President Trump's former campaign manager, Corey Lewandowski, and Citizens United President David Bossie provide an inside look at the 2016 presidential campaign in Let Trump Be Trump. In The Doomsday Machine, whistleblower Daniel Ellsberg, responsible for the leak of the Pentagon Papers, reports on the government's nuclear defense program and shares his experiences as a defense analyst. University of Texas Women's History Chair Jacqueline Jones recounts the life of political activist Lucy Parsons in The Goddess of Anarchy. Also being published this week, The Saboteur looks back at the life of a French aristocrat turned anti-Nazi saboteur during the French Resistance by ESPN The Magazine deputy editor Paul Kicks. 
Senior Circuit Judge on the U.S. Court of Appeals Stephen F. Williams explores how Russian lawyer Vasily Maklakov attempted to forge an alternative political path in the lead-up to the 1917 Russian Revolution in The Reformer. And in The Last Man Who Knew Everything, David Schwartz recalls the life of Manhattan Project physicist Enrico Fermi. Look for these titles in bookstores this coming week and watch for many of the authors in the near future on Book TV on C-SPAN 2. And we are back with Robert George and Cornell West in our New York studio. This is our in-depth program. And Sean in Battleground, Michigan, you have been very patient. Please go ahead with your question. Uh, actually, Battleground, Washington, but uh, thank you for this wonderful opportunity. Uh, Dr. West, I have in my hand a book that you co-authored about 20 years ago called The War Against Parents. Uh, you co-authored it with Sylvia Ann Hewlett. Uh, Dr. West, you referenced the Scandi Scandinavian economic model um, it's not a mystery what causes healthy, positive outcomes for children and families. They've been practicing in Scandinavia for years and years. The Christian right and the libertarian right have been marching arm in arm with deregulation and deunionization policies that we know devastate poor and working class children and families. These families have been catching hell now for the last 40 some years in this country. Um, when you have people like Charles Murray writing books um, like Coming Apart, a attacking the poor and working class for having poor moral fiber, and you have someone like Speaker Paul Ryan, who claims to be a Christian, he makes required reading Ayn Rand's Atlas Shrugged. Uh, it seems to me the Christian right's God is not Jesus. Their God is a kind of Nietzschean, uh, Ayn Rand, Ubermensch entrepreneur type. Who's, who, who epitomizes a kind of petty bourgeois mentality. I was wondering, could you expand All right, on Sean, we're going to start with Cornell West and then Robert George. Mm, no, no, Brother Sean, boy, he was on fire. He's laying it out there, uh, definitely. Again, I think when you talk about the Christian right, certainly there is such a thing. There's a lot of danger in terms of the hatred there, the, the contempt that we see too often, but it's not homogeneous either. There's a variety of different voices there. Certainly it's the case that not just the Christian right, but the American right as a whole has such a deep suspicion of government playing a fundamental role in the lives of everyday people that they 
can easily overlook the ways in which government intervention into the lives of everyday people can be profoundly empowering as opposed to simply be authoritarian and repressive. We had to keep track of the repressive effects of government intervening, but certainly when you look to Norway and Finland and other places, we see the government. We can look to Canada, our beloved Canada, just, a, just, just north of the border. The government can play a very important role in intervening into the lives of others to enhance liberty, to enhance well-being. So part of it is the ideological and a, a, a political question of perception and will. The Christian right suffers from it. The secular right can suffer, suffer from it. The Judaic right, the Buddhist right, the Hindu right, and so forth and so on. But I had great, great fun writing that book with my dear sister Sylvia Ann Hewlett, who's gone on to do magnificent things in terms of uh, issues of inclusion at the corporate level of women and peoples of color and gays and lesbians and trans and others. She's still going very strong with her Center for Talent and Innovation right here in New York. But that was over 20 years ago that war, the book, The War Against Parents, the ways in which parenting is the ultimate non-market activity in a market-driven society. Brother, other dissents. Uh, Sean's <laughs> comment was a highly ideological one. Uh, I kind of detected a sort of dogmatism uh, in it. Uh, I... Uh, I am not a fan of Ayn Rand. I'm a very uh, uh, sharp critic of, uh, of Ayn Rand. Mm -hmm. uh, the whole of the Christian right is not Randian. Uh, most of the Christian right is not, uh, not Randian. I have my own criticisms with some leading figures on the Christian mm -hmm. right these days, as you, uh, mm -hmm. as you might imagine. Uh, but uh, work done by Charles Murray, by Robert Putnam, uh, by uh, David and Amber Lapp, uh, and others on the cultural foundations of uh, the moral collapse that we see, not only in minority communities and in inner cities and places like that, but in Appalachia, uh, in the South, and old Rust Belt cities among white working class communities. Uh, the, 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 the cultural foundations of that are real, and they've got to be dealt with. We can go all the way back to 1965 when Daniel Patrick Moynihan, then uh, I think just a young uh, uh, Harvard professor who was working as uh, Assistant Deputy Secretary of Labor, if I recall correctly, uh, did his study that showed that the out-of-wedlock birth rate among African Americans had risen to 25 percent. And Moynihan could see what the consequences of that would be for this historically persecuted and oppressed uh, sector of our society. That that meant wide-scale fatherlessness, and together with that, uh, delinquency, despair, drug addiction, violence, incarceration in a, in a vicious uh, cycle. Uh, when Moynihan warned about all that, warned where it would lead, uh, for his efforts, he was labeled a racist. He was stigmatized. And so people went silent on cultural questions, on the cultural foundations of that. Uh, family collapse and, uh, and moral collapse for fear of being treated the way Moynihan was treated. And so a very significant aspect of the, part of the problem was swept uh, under the rug. The one thing Moynihan, I think, was wrong about was he thought it had mainly to do with race and the history of racial oppression. Uh, we now know that that is too simplistic uh, an account because we're seeing the same effects happening where the family has broken down for similar cultural, largely cultural reasons. Uh, in white working class communities and in Appalachia and in uh, other rural uh, areas. Now, we can make the mistake also of imagining that it's only culture, that economics has nothing to do with it, uh, mm -hmm. that other mm -hmm. factors, mm -hmm. uh, uh, including uh, racism, has nothing to do with it. That would be a mistake, too. But just as it would be a mistake to leave those factors out, it's also a mistake to leave these other factors out. Mm -hmm. And you can stigmatize mm -hmm. Murray and you can call him a, a, a racist. He's a libertarian. Uh, I, I'm a critic of libertarianism, but in his uh, recent work uh, calling attention uh, to the disparities uh, between uh, the haves, the wealthy, uh, and the have-nots, black and white, and the cultural basis and the importance of families, and especially intact families, uh, in uh, uh, the success that people have as citizens and as human beings, He's doing a service. So is Putnam, so are the Laps, so are Brad Wilcox and, mm -hmm. and, and other sociologists who are finally calling attention to this. Mm -hmm. So my plea is just not to oversimplify. Don't imagine that it's only culture, but don't leave right. culture out right. of it. Don't shoot the messengers, however much you don't like them, who deliver the message when the message is right. Mm -hmm. I think just add one point, you think about 
legacies of Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel Martin King Malcolm X, accenting the moral lapse among elites. Oh yeah, the moral lapse of Wall Street, the moral lapse of Ivy League institutes, the moral lapse of the journalistic elites. Not our dear brother Peter. Thank God, Sister Betty, his beloved mother. But but we're talking about moral lapses that cut across class. They go up. They go down, they go horizontal. It's not just a matter of focusing on the vulnerable ones, the coming apart, the poor whites or the poor blacks or poor browns or poor reds and so forth. This spiritual blackout that we're talking about cuts across every nook and cranny in sight in our and empire. I, th I think it also has to be pointed out that while the spiritual consequences of this moral collapse mm -hmm. are borne most heavily uh, uh, well, the, the spiritual con consequences are really borne by everybody. Right, right. The, material the material consequences are borne most, most heavily by the most vulnerable, oh, by, by the poor, absolutely. whether they're black or white. I agree. I agree. Uh, and, 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 and people are finally starting to call attention to that problem. One of the things Murray says in his new book uh, is very often you see now a rebuilding, a successful marriage culture, lower divorce rates, more family formation, uh, among educated and affluent uh, elites. Things seem to be going in the right direction while things continue to go in the wrong direction for poor and working class people. So Murray says it's time for elites to start preaching what they practice. Mm. Don't preach moral relativism when you're actually practicing the moral virtues that are leading mm. to successful oh, lives for yourselves and your, your children. Yeah. Yeah. And, and working class and poorer people who often are devout religious believers and who preach a message of family integrity, fidelity, uprightness need to need to actually practice what they uh, they preach. And I think there's some some truth to that. Uh, I, I, I think we need to call really on everybody to lead the kinds of lives that will not only produce spiritual value, but also make them materially better off. Absolutely. From Robert George's book, Conscience and Its Enemies, Professor West, he writes, the two greatest institutions for lifting people out of poverty and enabling them to live in dignity are the market economy and the institution of marriage. These two stand or fall together. Yeah, no, I'm not sure that I, I certainly would acknowledge the importance of those two. Very much so. But we'd have to first examine much more closely what kind of market economy we're talking about, what kind of marriage we're talking about. There are many marriages that actually need to terminate because of people catching hell, the patriarchal violence, the indifference, the callousness, and so forth. One proceeds very cautiously, but certainly what, what is the quality of each one of those categories that he puts forth? And I think Brother Robbie would, would agree with that. That's one sentence mm -hmm. out of the, the text. The question becomes, okay, now let's look at the kinds of market economies that can provide the requisite conditions for the flowering of our fellow citizens. And there's a variety of different kinds. Let's look at the kinds of marriages. There's a variety of different kinds of marriages. There are some very ugly patriarchal marriages of abuse that there's no way that the woman can live a life of well-being, you see. And I'm sure Brother Robbie sure. would call that into question. So that would be the first, my first response to that particular, particular sentence. Right? My so. point is if you destroy one of them, you will destroy the other. And if you destroy both of them, then no one is going to flourish. Uh, I, I'm not defending every form of market economy. I'm not mm, right, defending right. Every, uh, every marriage. Uh, I've already uh, said that I think the problem with crony capitalism is that it undermines the functioning of the market. Uh, absolutely. It prevents the market absolutely. from doing what the market does well when, when it's properly functioning, which is it increases quality, it lowers prices, it provides employment opportunity and social mobility for those who are at the bottom of the scale, enables them to rise. When I say the market, that's what, right, that's, that's what I'm interested absolutely. in. And I want a culture in which uh, uh, families uh, uh, function to transmit the virtues that children need in order to be successful lives, uh, to lead successful lives and be contributing yes. good uh, uh, citizens. Uh, that, that's no, in no way to license abuse or right. uh, any of the other Domination problems. That you're and and so, I mean, it's true that Brother Ravi and I, we really wrestle with the issue of our uh, 
precious gay brothers and lesbian sisters and trans because there, for example, the very notion of what some people call same-sex marriage or a love that flows in which person of the same gender. That Brother Robbie has always, in our dialogue, been very cautious and very careful in saying, as a Christian, he still loves gay brothers and lesbian sisters made in the image of God. And so he's trying to stay in contact with their humanity, even as he is critical of same-sex marriage. Is that, is right. that a fair characterization? Yeah, absolutely. And yeah. then the question becomes, and I push him on that because I, I, I'm very much uh, one who, who supports love flowing in a variety of different forms, even in legalized. Uh, uh, having legalized status when it comes to gay brothers and lesbians, sisters, or trans folk, or whatever. And, and there we get theological in terms of what kinds of resources can I pull, can he pull to generate support for his argument, to generate support for my argument. And that's a serious matter because there's certain biblical passages that one can invoke that are highly critical of same-sex sex, sex marriage. Uh, there's crystal centric, crystal centric understandings of of the biblical text in which you focus very much on Jesus. Why was Jesus silent on the issue? If Paul says X, if Paul says slaves be obedient to your masters. Well, we're not going to accept that. If Paul says something about same sex marriages, we might accept that. Those are the kinds of dialogues that we have, and I think those are the kind of dialogues that we need to have in the country that begin with the preciousness of each, every one of us as human beings, and then move to various ways in which we disagree regarding the coming together in a marriage or coming together in a relationship or what have you. Yeah, the bedrock principle is that of the profound, inherent, and equal dignity of the human being. Right. All, Mago all Dei. Human Mago that, Dei. That, that's it. Is the, to put it in religious terms, the idea of man made in the image and likeness of God. Now, in these uh, areas of uh, morality and family, my own arguments yes. tend not yes. to be, this, I suppose, would be typical for a Catholic, be a different situation that's for that's a Protestant. That's my arguments that's tend true. to be natural law arguments, right. philosophical right. arguments, right. not appeals to Scripture. I, I do think that Scripture can enlighten us. I think it can... Uh, that's true. Uh, it's it more, it's more Protestants it, who would vote the Scripture. That's right. It, so it tends, to be, it tends yeah. to be on the I'm Protestant glad you, side glad where, you that, where, that, where that. that tends to be yeah, uh, absolutely. Uh, made, more, made more central. Uh, but the the fundamental issue for me, I mean, the great majority of cases, are, you're going to you're, you're going to have opposite opposite sex relations. The crit critical thing for me is that those relationships be supported by a culture that will enable them not only to last, but to provide the milieu in which parents can transmit essential virtues that will enable their children to resist all the terrible temptations mm -hmm. that can yeah. reduce them to narcissism, yeah. selfishness. We're living in the wake of the me gen This was our generation, the me mm -hmm. generation, whose, mm -hmm. whose motto, whose slogan was, if it feels good, do it. Well, a lot of young people of successor generations have taken that to heart, and it's a very, very bad message. Now, how can we empower men and women to transmit to their children a different message and to, to inculcate in, it in them in a way that will enable them to resist the temptations to think that what really matters in life is me, 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 me. Money, power, mm -hmm. influence, wealth, uh, sta so, social standing, status, respect, and so forth. Mm -hmm. I mean, the sad thing is that so many children in the last 30 years or so, it reminds me of Philip Larkin's thing about how my, my parents messed me up it's the parents who've been narcissistic. It's oh, the yeah. parents who've been indifferent. The parents who've been callous. And they pass that on to the younger generation. The younger generation has to find countervailing ways of being in the world over against what their parents transmitted to them. You know, when we moved in the direction of uh, no-fault divorce, which was go going all the way back into the 60s, uh, actually, uh, decent people thought this was going to be a boon for everybody. It would be good for, for the, the spouses because if they weren't able to get along, they could separate and that, that would be that and there would be less fuss and bother and less of a burden on the courts and on the public uh, uh, purse mm -hmm. because the public purse supports the courts and so forth. And they even thought it would be good for children because it's got to be bad for children living in 
conflict situations with their with their parents. But if you look at work that's done by uh, uh, sociologists today, again, like people like uh, uh, the the Laps and and others, uh, work on the consequences of of no fault divorce. You know, they, it has not been good for children. Uh, children, in most cases, where there's not violence or abuse, even where there's a high degree of conflict, do better with their parents sticking together. But what have we done to support marriages? Very little. Goodness. What have we done to encourage parents to stick together? Very little. What have we done to provide cultural support for parents, to make mm. it easier mm. for them to sustain their marriages? Really very little. Now, this is not a critique of government fundamentally, because there's very little that government can do here other than get divorce policy right, get family law policy right. The real work has to be done by the institutions of civil society. It's got to be done by those non-governmental institutions, what Burke called the little platoons, mm. Uh, mm. family, uh, extended family, uh, church, other religious uh, community, uh, neighborhoods, civic groups, uh, uh, groups that, uh, in which people of different uh, ethnicities and faiths and so forth support, uh, support each other. That's where the real work in supporting marriage and the family has to be. But if the government did help provide jobs with a living wage, quality housing, arts programs, music programs, sports programs, the channel, the energies of young people in such a way that it was tied more to public interest rather than just privatistic orientation, that would be a way in which, like Scandinavian countries, families could possibly be sites where children would flower and flourish. You certainly need those things. Now, yes, whether yes. government should be the provider of well, not, those not things. Not the sole, but can play a partnership well, and a role well, and a well, fundamental... Right. But part of, the, well, well, the part of it yes, seems to me the yes. way we do that is have taxation at a rate that will enable people to retain enough of their money to be able to pr provide things like music lessons and ballet lessons and religious education and so forth for their for their children. Also to put parents in a situation where if they want to choose private, including religious education, I know you've been very good on this, mm -hmm. private and religious mm -hmm. education, they're able to do that. And mm -hmm. then the situation now, of course, is one in which, you know, people pay often property taxes to support public schools, right. even though they want right. to send their own kids to religious schools. And it's increasingly expensive, even in the Catholic world. In the old days, when priests and nuns did most of the staffing of Catholic schools, mm. you could keep the cost down. Well, the vocations crisis in the Catholic Church now means it's more difficult uh, to do that. The costs of education become uh, higher and higher. It's harder for parents to uh, afford to send their kids to Catholic schools. So I, 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 I think government yeah. does have a role to play here. But mm. often it is in facilitating rather than in actually providing the services and support that's, that's needed. I'd rather mm. see civil society liberated to do that providing than to have government come in and try to do it directly. Yes, yes, Cornell West yes. and Robert George are our guests. Here's a couple of their books. Cornell West's best-selling Race Matters. First came out in 1993, brand new, out again this year for the 21st, 25th anniversary with a new introduction, Democracy Matters came out in 2004. His autobiography, Brother West, Living Out Loud, came out in 2009. Black Prophetic Fire, 2014. Here's a couple of Robert George's books, including Making Men Moral, 1995, The Clash of Orthodoxies, which we've talked about today in 2001, Conscience and Its Enemies, 2013, and Conjugal Union, What Marriage Is and Why It Matters. We've done a little discussion on that today as well. Cornell West, if somebody wanted to buy one of your books, which one do you recommend to them? I would tell them to buy James Baldwin the fire next time. <laughs> I'd tell them listen to some Curtis Mayfield and John Coltrane and Nina Simone. There's so many other voices more important than mine. I would never just promote my own text. But if they had a little extra time, I would say read. Race Matters with New Introduction. Robert second. George, same question to you. Uh, well, I suppose it would, it would depend on a person's particular interest. If they're interested in the deeper sorts of philosophical uh, questions, uh, then I'd recommend uh, my, my book, Making Men Moral, Civil Liberties and mm -hmm. Public Morality, which is the subtitle mm -hmm. of, of, uh, of, of that book. Um, 
that's the book on the basis of which I uh, was given tenure at, uh, at Princeton. So it's a kind of special book. It was my mm-hmm. first, uh, first book. I, I, I reread it uh, recently, and uh, I, I, I still think I'm right about that. <laughs> uh, much of the rest of the academic community thinks I'm wrong uh, about but it. But 22 years. But that's, found it, that's, found that's it interesting enough uh, to, uh, to, to award me tenure. Mm-hmm. Uh, if, if people are interested in contemporary issues, uh, issues of marriage and sanctity of human life and uh, all, all the kinds of things we've been talking about today, then perhaps my book, Conscience and Its Enemies, uh, which is my most recent book, would be, uh, be the one to look at. I've also uh, written with co-authors uh, books on part- particular topics. Mm-hmm. So if, if people are interested in, in abortion and euthanasia and infanticide and those kinds of issues, uh, I have a book that I've written with uh, the philosopher Christopher Tollefson called Embryo, A Defense of Human Life. Uh, and if people are interested in the marriage issue, I have a book uh, that I wrote with two of my uh, former students, Sharif Girgis and uh, Ryan Anderson, a pair of brilliant young men. And that book is called What is Marriage, Man and Woman a Defense? Mm-hmm. Eric is in Lutherville, Maryland. Hi, Eric. Hi, how are you? I have a question primarily for, for Professor West, but uh, also for the other professor as well. I'm trying to understand the last, the last eight years of the Obama presidency, and he painted a very progressive agenda when he was running as a candidate, uh, never delivered on a large portion of that progressive agenda. And I'm wondering whether that was caused because the agenda wasn't his real core beliefs, whether he lacked the courage to uh, pursue those beliefs or whether it was just the dynamics of the political era that we're living in. Yeah, I appreciate your question. I think one of the revealing moments of the Obama administration was March 2009 when he met with leading Wall Street uh, uh, heads of uh, firms there. and And they told him, that they were wondering what he had to say. And he told them, I stand between you and the pitchforks, but I rest assure you, I am on your side. I will protect you. You have little to worry about. And that's a failure of nerve. That's a spinelessness. It's a lack of courage. That that's what you tell poor people. That's what you tell working people. That's what you tell black people, red people. You don't tell Wall Street elites that I will protect you, I am on their side. It's no accident not one Wall Street executive went to jail given the massive crimes that were committed in terms of the predatory lending and insider trading, market manipulation, and fraudulent activity. So it was very clear you'd have a Wall Street-friendly neoliberal Democratic Party in power. And the same was true in terms of his foreign policy. When he preserved his elites in the State Department and in the Pentagon so that the same folk tied to drone strikes, the the, the, the Brennans Brennans and others, remained in power. When he brought in Tim Geithner from Wall Street, he brought in my dear brother Larry Summers, smart (laughs) as a tack, but at the same time, at that time, tied to deregulating neoliberal policies. It was clear he had Wall Street friendly, drone presidency escalating, and therefore a lot of the progressive rhetoric and that audacity of hope would become empty in regard to poor people and working people. Symbolically, he was masterful. What I mean symbolically is that to have a black face in the highest place in the American society, empire, and government meant that not only we'd made progress, which we had, but it was as if black people were being empowered. I mean, we got Brother Coates writing the book, we were in power for eight years. And you look around at poor people, look around at the hoods, look around the ghettos, look around the schools, look around at the, 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 the massive unemployment and the mass, massive incarceration. You say, wow, who was in power for eight years? No, these black neoliberal middle class folk were in power. They're the ones whose careers took off. They're the ones who did very well. Ask the poor people, on the, ask the folk in prison, ask the folk in the hoods whether they were in power. Not at all. There was a failure of nerve, not just among Barack Obama, but among intellectuals. Black intellectuals became cheerleaders for Barack Obama. The same folk who talked about Martin Luther King Jr. as the exemplar of justice 
didn't want to talk about poverty. The same folk who talk about Martin Luther King Jr. as the great exemplar of justice, critical of Vietnam and the bombs dropped on the babies there, didn't want to say a word about the drone strikes that were dropping on babies in Yemen and Pakistan and so forth. The same folk even on the Middle East would want to talk about justice consistently, didn't say a mumbling word when 550 precious Palestinian babies were killed in 50 days. Barack Obama didn't say a mumbling word either. Why? Because he lacks courage. He's spineless. He didn't want to tell the truth. He's a politician. It was not in his interest to speak about that kind of suffering, you see. And so we ended up with another politician rather than a visionary leader. Now, was he a good politician? Absolutely. He got elected twice. Was he better than John Cain? Absolutely. Was he better than who was the other brother who ran? Mitt Romney? Absolutely. But did he fall short in terms of the standards of the Martin Kings and others? Absolutely. And not enough people told that truth. I'll let everyone in on a little secret. Big business does not consider big government to be its enemy. <laughs> That's true. They, they tie yeah. together. Big like business this. loves they, big government. Exactly. Wall they Street tie loves big government. That's now, true. upstart entrepreneurs don't necessarily love right. big government. Small right. business people don't love big big That's government. Right. That's but right. big business does because big business benefits from well, big Wall government. Street, I'll, I'll tell you my you own know. story. It obviously doesn't have to do with President Obama, whom I never uh, met. Um, but I was, uh, I served during the Bush administration as um, uh, second but George W. Bush on the President's Council on Bioethics. And on a number of occasions in relation to that, I was uh, in the White House uh, advising him on bioethical issues. And we developed a, a, a good relationship. I have a lot of respect for him. Um, he called me in, though, with uh, two or three other uh, professors uh, right at the end, in his last mm. week mm. Uh, in office, uh, to talk about his memoir. He was already mm. planning his uh, memoir. Uh, so uh, we were talking about his uh, eight years, and right in the front of his mind was something that had just happened, which was the bailout of the big banks, oh, yeah. the big bailouts. And unprovoked by, uh, by any of us, he just said, as if talking to himself almost, he said, you know, I hated to do that. I hated to authorize that. Everything in me said no. You don't bring government in to bail out businesses that have failed, that have failed because of their own practices. That's not the role of government. Absolutely. I'm a free market guy. And yet, he said, what could I do? The leading people on Wall Street and the leading Wall Street representatives like Snow in my administration are telling me that if we don't do this, it will be a 1929 stock market catastrophe. What could I do? I had to authorize the bailout. Wall Street has tremendous influence in any administration, Republican or Democrat. They can be very pro-market in theory, pro-free market in theory, but if Wall Street wants a big government intervention in the market, That's Wall Street's right. going to get it. They can be very progressive in theory, but if Wall Street wants something, Wall Street's going to get it. It's very hard to stand up against that. And in President Bush's case, I mean, he did not want to be the president who presided over the next great depression. And he felt that his hands were tied on this and he had no choice. Wall Street got what it wanted. Free market guys were not in favor of those bailouts. My free market friends were scandalized right, by it. Right, and yet Wall right. Street wanted it. Wall Street got but it. The difference is that President Bush didn't put a figure of Mar a, a representation of Martin Luther King Jr. in the corner, acting as if you you're working on yeah. his project and based on his legacy. So it's more consistent even with President Bush as a conservative. If you're going to be someone coming out of the legacy of Martin King, you're going to be courageous, sacrificial, service oriented for the weak. If not, just tell the truth. I'm a neoliberal. I might have a statue of him, but I don't have no plans of really following through supporting the vulnerable. I'm not going to bail out Main Street. I'm not going to bail out the homeowners. I'm going to bail out Wall Street. Be honest. And we did a lot of black people who have been moderate. Whitney Young was not Martin Luther King Jr. Whitney Young didn't run around and act like he's Malcolm X. He didn't run around and act like he's Martin Luther King Jr. He was Whitney Young, head of the Urban League. He was a moderate. So if you go to a moderate, say you're a moderate. Don't act like you're some kind of progressive and radical when you're really a moderate. That was part of my critique of Barack Obama. Don't use Martin Luther King. He struggled too much. He suffered too much. He paid the ultimate price. Quit manipulating his witness 
with neoliberal policies. If you're going to get in trouble, you're going to follow Martin. If you want to be moderate and adjust to the status quo, you're going to follow Whitney Young. Just tell the people the truth. That's all. That's like, that's like saying you show up at a concert acting like you Al Green, <laughs> and then you start singing like, like a, a brown version of Pat Boone or something. Say, hey, <laughs> tell people the truth. This is who I am. Quit lying about yourself. This is the thing that upsets me. But not only that, but that's part of the best of the black tradition. Robert mm. Havlin, email. Facebook, Twitter have become the new non-state powers which have a huge impact on societies worldwide. They seem to accelerate polarization and disinformation. There's some truth in that, and I can't contradict it. Now, now, uh, I I also spoke earlier about my my worries about monopoly and oligopoly, and especially when it comes to civil liberties and free speech issues, when it comes to these these types of uh, firms and platforms. but uh, I think that people who care about the quality of our civic discourse can use those platforms to counteract the bad things that this gentleman rightly points mm. to. Mm. Um, I, in my, uh, in my own uh, work, use Facebook as a kind of ongoing seminar. Uh, I, uh, I have serious discussions with Facebook friends of serious uh, issues. Uh, I call to the attention of my friends things that I think are worth reading. When I say my friends, these are mostly people I've never met in my life, but they're people with whom I've developed uh, relationships uh, online because they're interested in the kinds of moral and political, civic, uh, religious issues that that I'm uh, interested in. So my advice uh, to the gentleman is let's make the most of Facebook. It's not going to go away. Facebook and Twitter are going to be here. We're not going to get rid of them. Now, there may be some steps that we can... That, that, we, that we can take to uh, make them behave a little bit better than they are behaving. But we ourselves, in using those uh, uh, assets, uh, can use them to counteract the bad things and to advance things that uh, would improve the quality of our civic life. Absolutely. I mean, you think, for example, of the great um, Reverend William Barber II, who's reviving the Poor People's Campaign right now. When he uses this new technology... It's a way of reaching out across race and class and gender and sexual orientation to bring people together. That's qualitatively different than the neo-Nazis who we were staring down in Charlottesville just a few months ago who used the same technology to bring together the fascists, crypto-fascists and others to try to bring some kind of uh, uh, contentious uh, attitudes toward blacks and Jews and Muslims and Palestinians and gays and lesbians and Catholics and others. Even though David Duke is a Catholic in the Klan, but the Klan began partly as anti-Catholic. That's up with mobility American style, you see. Get a Catholic head of the Ku Klux Klan. My God, so, yeah. you, so someday you'll have a Negro head. I, <laughs> I did see a black person who marched in the Charlottesville. Who marched with the Nazis? With the Nazis. The Negro had the, a the world U.S. flag. A very said, complicated oh, no, place. There's confusion <laughs> everywhere. There's confusion everywhere. Very much so. But generally speaking, it reflects who we are as persons. So that the bastardization, the, 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 the division and so forth, that's what we bring to the technology. If we haven't undergone some pie day or prior to what yeah, that's we it. bring, then it's that's going it. to reflect. It's going to be reflected. That's exactly right. Supriya is in Edgewater, New Jersey. Please go ahead with your question or comment. Hi, thanks so much. It's been great listening to both of you. Um, I'm really, I feel um, more than just informed by this conversation and uh, educated, but um, I feel um, my heart is healed a little bit. And so I want to echo the calls from others to figure out a way. There is a way. Um, And I know, uh, Professor George, I think you said you'd been, you know, kind of wrangling with this issue of bringing your seminar to the public, et cetera. But um, uh, there is a way, and uh, much more creative minds than I can figure it out. Um, but we got to get you on television, and we got to get this out, because um, I think the way that you both go about having these discussions, disagreeing with each other, and the obvious affection that you have for each other is really important. So having said that, let me get to my question, which is going back to um, a framework that you – uh, uh, brought up earlier, you were discussing earlier, for how this sort of American experience or experiment uh, works with these three sort of uh, 
elements, right? We have the free markets, we have um, the foundation of virtuosity, and we have, uh, sorry, a second pillar of um, democracy. And I guess my question is, how in the world, where do we begin when I think what's become so obvious to so many of us in the last year, um, we have some really deep problems in all three of those areas. You know, I, I mean, I, I've been spending the last year trying to figure out where to focus my attention, and I'm one person of millions who's doing the same exact thing. Question is, where do we begin? Um, is there a chicken or egg kind of situation here? Or are there things that we can be doing um, that Supriya, are more important thank you than for others? your time today. Let's hear from the professors who wants mm -hmm. to start this stuff. Right in well, right Supriya, thank you very much, not only mm -hmm. for your kind comment, but for your very thoughtful uh, uh, question. And it's, it's, it's the right question. Uh, I've wrestled with it uh, myself. Here's the best I can do. Uh, I think all of us can do a service to all of the rest of us by reaching out to people whom we know have a very different perspective on basic issues than we have. So if you're not a Trump person, and especially if you're someone highly critical of Trump or someone who's afraid of Trump, get to know a Trump voter. Get to know them, not just to lecture them, not, not just to harangue them, but to try to understand where they're coming from. I think that would be a service. If you're a Trump person, if you're a Trump voter, uh, and you think uh, that, uh, that uh, Trump is the tribune of the people to stand up against these uh, horrible uh, elites, get to know one of those horrible elites. You know, reach out in a personal way uh, and just, just listen. One of the things we need to do, one of the great things mm. with Brother Corey, mm. I mean, I, yeah. I love listening to this cat. So, well, you know, it's easy to listen. So, and, and, and listening is where it, it, it begins. And I think sending a signal across the ideological or partisan divide that I'm willing to listen is the necessary first, first step. I mean, we're badly divided in this country. We're deeply, deeply polarized. It's not the first time this has happened. We go back to the election of 1800. Certainly look at the Civil War, look at the division over slavery. But it's still, you know, even considered against that historical backdrop, this is a period of deep polarization, animosity, resentment, Americans resenting other Americans, Americans thinking of other Americans as villains. Large numbers, 62 million thinking of 62 million as villains, with the other side thinking of the first 62 million as, as villains. If this precious experiment in Republican government and ordered liberty is going to survive, we're going to have to get past this. And it begins with talking with each other, and you can't talk to someone else across that kind of divide unless you signal to that person a willingness to listen. So let's begin there, it seems to me. Absolutely. I, I think what one begins with oneself because one, on the one hand, has been shaped by traditions in the past. We critically appropriate the best. We hold it arm's length the worst. But also you attempt to exemplify in your thoughts, in your actions, in your organizations, in your networks the kind of truth-telling, witness-bearing, but also more than that. And this relates to present-day music again, because, you see, Robbie and I grew up in a time in which you had tenderness and sweetness and kindness shot through your music. You had groups that could sing, not just in tune, but touch the soul at the deepest level. They weren't just titillating the body. These days, the music mm -hmm. titillates the body in order to make money as opposed to shaping the souls in order to make persons stronger, to make persons spiritually equipped and, and, and ready to take on the world. Curtis Mayfield didn't sing just to make money. He equipped people of all colors to deal with the crises and catastrophes with smile, style, humor. That's what's missing. We need all of that in our own lives. We need that in movements in left-wing movements, centrist movements, where is the humor that allows us to laugh at ourselves such that we can grow and thereby be better relative to who we are? Because some people are going to be who they are. Everybody's who they are, not somebody else. Right? No, everybody's not going to agree with you, but you can touch them. You can unsettle them. But if they shut down before you even get a chance yeah. to touch and unsettle, then we even more divided in that way, you see. And Robbie and I, I mean, we, we brothers for life. And we're going to fight, we're going to struggle, and so forth and so on, you see. But at that human level, that's just the way it is. No matter how unpopular we become or whatever, it ain't about unpopularity. It's about the kind of human beings we choose to be 
before the worms get our body. That's the kind of tradition we come from. That's the kind of people we come from. That's the making, not just of, the country, of this country. That's true for every other country. America has no monopoly on integrity. They got it in Lithuania. You got it in Kurds in Turkey. And the Jews got it in Tel Aviv. And the Palestinians got it on the Gaza Bank. If they are willing to be courageous, you got the same cowardice in each place. So in that sense, it's really a human thing. Most of human history is a history of domination and hatred. That's what it is. All we're trying to do is interrupt it. We're trying to disrupt it. You know, when you're talking about Curtis Mayfield, I'm thinking Hank Williams. Oh, Hank, you know, he's, 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 he's a genius Touching on the, the vanilla side of yeah, town. Yeah, that yeah. country music, soulful to the core, but different kind of twang, different kind of rhythm, different kind of drum beat, but... Very similar story. Very similar story. <laughs> yeah. Connected Bob Marley, imitating Bob Marley, them yeah. both of them in, 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 in Jamaica with his genius. You know, Absolutely. one of the things we tend to do, uh, Supriya, is we, we, we try to signal things to each other, especially others in a group that we're already comfortable in, uh, to, to make clear that we're in the in-group. We're on your side. Uh, we, we, we say things, especially saying things about other people with different beliefs, <laughs> Uh, that are meant to strengthen our bond with people in our tribe. That's well, right. I think we need to be willing a little bit to be the gadfly in the tribe. Do what Brother Cornell has done so well on the progressive side. You know, question some of these established orthodoxies. Don't worry so much about signaling that I'm an insider and I'm on the uh, okay. a part of the in crowd. Be a little willing to uh, take the risk of being an outcast. And, and, if, and, if, and if you're made an outcast, that's just something that we're going to have to we're going to have to live with it. It's much better to have integrity. It's much better to try to do something to reform a situation badly in need of reform than to just live with the comfort of being in the in crowd by saying what other people want to hear. Have you ever been criticized for your friendship with Cornell West and vice versa? Very rarely in my case. One of the, I have to hand it to my uh, conservative uh, friends. Um, very rarely has... I think that one exception would be on issues having to do with Israel, mm. where mm. Uh, mm. Uh, Cornell has been perceived yeah. by some conservatives as going over the line, right? yeah. too harshly yeah. critical of Israel. Now, I know in my heart there is not anything anti-Semitic about Cornell West. He, he's, he's got a heart for the Palestinian people and their suffering. He wants to see uh, justice done. We would have some disagreements sure, about sure, is, sure. Israeli policy. Uh, but no government, and, and, and I want all my friends who, who share my uh, support for Israel to understand, there's no government that should be immune from criticism. There's no government that doesn't make mistakes. The Israeli government has made mistakes. The, the Netanyahu government has made mistakes. They've done things that are wrong. Uh, nobody is perfect. So those criticisms are perfectly legitimate. Now, there are people, and this is what's causing the sensitivities, I think. There are people who go over the line, who use criticism of the Israeli government and the state of Israel as a pretext for expressing anti-Semitism. Right. There are people who would like That's to right. see Israel disappear from the face of the earth. I believe it's still in the Palestinian charter, isn't it, Cornell? I'm not sure, but I believe it's still in the Palestinian charter they, that Israel they, should they, cease, they, they shifted on cease that, to, ex still, cease to exist. Elements on them, right? uh, you know, so I think that's caused the sensitivities that in some circles have led people to say, how can you, Robbie right, George, right. a strong supporter of Israel and the Jewish people, uh, associate with Cornell West. Now, other if, if people who know me also know that I have been one of the leading voices, I think it's fair to say, correct me if I'm wrong, Cornell, mm -hmm. uh, on the Christian and the conservative side in defending the rights of Muslims. Uh, I, 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 I made that a big part of my work. I, I was part of the, on the commission. U.S. Commission on, the commission. Uh, on, on International We had uh, many joint freedom. statements supporting our Muslim brothers and sisters. That's exactly and Robert right. Robert does that on the local level. You ask the local Muslim leaders exactly there right. in, in Jersey. So, no, that's so I, I think that's we need true. to avoid tribalism of any, of, of any sort here. But apart from that, I, I, I'm really proud of my conservative friends who, who, who really have seen value in the work that Cornell and I yeah. do. Yeah. They have great respect for this man, by the way. Great respect for him. Have you been criticized for your friendship? Oh, sure, though. You know, the left just tend to be a bit more vociferous than the right-wing brothers when it comes to that. A number of them say, we understand why you spend time where his stance on same-sex marriage. We wrestle on abortion issues. We wrestle on issues of the extent of regulation and so forth. And, uh, and I just tell them, I say, one, I mean, you don't understand who he is as a human being. You have a stereotype of him. You understand a conservative and then think that somehow by some 
law of transitivity, you can grasp his complexity because he calls himself a conservative. Well, every conservative in a stereotypical sense is in no way a human being who is conservative. It has a variety of different complexities, orientations that don't conform to the stereotype. So I just tell him up front, you never met the brother. Won't you come to dinner with us? Won't you come to lunch with us? Have a drink with us. Have some coffee with us. Well, he doesn't drink that, but, but I have my cognacs. But, uh, but the, uh, so in that sense, I know that, that. And it's the same sense when he, when he tells them. He said, well, Brother West says that if there was a Palestinian occupation of Jewish brothers and sisters, he would be saying the exact the same thing against Palestinian occupation that he says against Israeli occupation. It's a, it's a consistent moral and spiritual issue. Palestinian baby has the same value as a Jewish baby and vice versa. Innocence on both sides, humanity on both sides. How do we proceed? If we can disagree on tactics and strategy. We've got to make sure our spiritual and moral foundations are in place. So it is with Brother Robbie. Brother Robbie, now we went to, uh, to Dallas with Brother Flowers, Terry Flowers. That's exactly at St. Right. Phillips Academy. It's all black, uh, 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 precious young people there. And his engagement, not just at the personal spiritual level, but also in terms of of the framework that he provided in terms of paideia that's empowering to them. He's the only vanilla brother in the room. But the human connection is made. Flowers' visionary leadership makes a difference. Absolutely fantastic. I need to tell your viewers about this school in Dallas, Texas. Uh, Dr. and Mrs. Flowers, it's a labor of love on their part. They have no public funding whatsoever. They take children of prostitutes, drug addicts, kids who you think are lost. They have no future. They're going to end up in jail. They're going to end up in trouble. They take these kids and they give them a first-class education. I don't even know how they do it, Cornell. But well, they do it out of love. They do. I know they why they do it, yeah. how they pull this off. And the kids end up going to Notre Dame and Baylor and Stanford yeah, and good universities. Though. All over the, but you got a genius like Erica Badu. Her kids go there. Yeah, she's one of the greatest artists of our time. So you got a variety of different kids there, all beautifully black and brown, and yet that love is there. And Harlan Crow actually has made a contribution, as he, you know. He, he has got, indeed. He got, he to his very great and Kathy to their great. But is who is Harlan Crow? He's come up several times. <laughs> he's, <laughs> he's a friend of ours. Yeah, he's. he's Camel Pro Real Estate down in, uh, down in Dallas. He's a very generous uh, donor to many, many uh, good causes, including the school that the, that the Flowers uh, run for, for black kids in, uh, uh, in Dallas. They, it's, it's, it's wonderful to see. The kids are there in their school uniforms, and they're, they're being taught no, not only uh, classroom uh, skills, but just the, the, the human yes, skills. That's right. Uh, the, 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 the rules of politess. Self-respect. Uh, spe- se- res- respect for others. Self-respect. Yeah. Geniality. How you're sensitive to other people's needs, all those things that go into the making of any human being of integrity. At the end of the day, this is a retail operation, isn't it? Soulcraft is a retail operation. Mm-hmm. You know, it's working with individual kids. It's somebody, a parent, a teacher, a coach, a grandparent, a, pra- a pastor, working with individual kids. Mm-hmm. I just got a message from my producer. It says, You can just go home, it's cool. They got this. <laughs> I think you're right. Jim, Pine Ridge, South Dakota, you're on with Cornell West and Robert George. Good morning, gentlemen. Uh, I have a question How you doing, to sir? both of you. Hey, Jim, you got to turn down the volume on your TV. There's a little bit of a delay. Why don't you go ahead, hit the volume, and just go ahead and state your question. We can hear you. My question to both uh, professors is, what are your thoughts about rewriting the U.S. Constitution to make it truly more equal for all peoples? Thank you. Thank you, Jim, very much. Um, U.S. Constitution. Mm. I rather like the one we have. Now, uh, uh, I I do think that uh, from time to time, reconsidering elements of the Constitution uh, is important. The Constitution itself provides methods, more than one, by the way, right, uh, right, for its right. own amendment. Uh, so it contemplates the possibility of improvements uh, being made. Uh, but um, uh, I think the fundamental structure of the Constitution uh, is a work of extraordinary genius. 
Uh, and we would we'd be making a bad mistake if we threw over things like the separation of powers. Uh, the concept of the national government as a government of delegated and enumerated and therefore limited powers, and the states of government as governments of general jurisdiction exercising uh, plenary uh, authority, federalism. Um, uh, there are, I think, crucial uh, dimensions of our of our Bill of Rights that I wouldn't want to see touched. Mm. Now, Jefferson, Thomas Jefferson, believed that the dead hand of the past should not control the living. So he wanted to have a new constitutional convention. Uh, every 20 years, so what his sense yeah. of what a generation yeah. would be. Uh, I don't think that would be a good idea. The, the, the founders with this Constitution have given us a way of preserving something that was, before that time, uh, impossible to preserve, which is Republican government. Government not only of the people, which all government is, and not only for the people, which all good government is, even if it's a benign despotism, but this mm -hmm. rare thing, government by the people. Our problems have not come from our Constitution or from our uh, excess of fidelity <coughs> to constitutional principles, our problems, whether it's racism, uh, no matter what it is, have been a lack of fidelity to our constitutional principles. Had we honored the Declaration's principle that all men are created equal, we would have done away with slavery from the very beginning. We wouldn't have had Jim Crow. We wouldn't have had segregation. The problem wasn't the principle. It was our failure to live up to the principle. The same is true with the separation of powers. The same is true in so many other areas. Uh, an area that I'm concerned about is the seepage of legislative authority off to the executive branch and the agencies Absolutely. on the one side and off to the courts on the other side. Congress does everything but legislate and take responsibility and be accountable for legislation. We're governed not by our elected representatives. We're not governed by ourselves through our elected representatives. We're governed by people we've never heard of in bureaucratic agencies, and we're governed by courts on crucial issues. So I want to see fidelity. I want to come back to the constitutional principles that we have. We don't need new ones. We need greater fidelity to the ones we have. Mm, There's a wonderful book I just read called In the Shadows of the American Century, written by a brother named Alfred McCoy. And he makes the point that to live in an empire in which the executive branch eclipses the others in terms of its ability to engage in prerogative activity, to do things with little accountability. People have called this the imperial presidency. Yeah. But it's a presidency that goes hand in hand with an imperial America. We got, what, 587 bases in 42 countries and 140 special operation activities around the world, you see. So we are, in that sense, a, a kind of empire in a very real way. And the question becomes, can government by the people, for the people, and of the people survive in the face of an empire with military overreach, corruption of elites, a culture driven by market sensibilities, unconcerned about the centrality of public life, common good, and a rule of law that can be undercut by big money? Now, that's a serious situation, and I think it requires more than just a rewriting of a constitution. It has to do with the kind of people we are. The marvelous constitution that we had was still a pro-slavery document for over 80 years. The marvelous constitution after the 1880s was still very much a pro-monopoly capitalist constitution in which poor people, when the workers get the right to vote, I mean, to, to engage in collective bargaining, the, eight, the 1930s. It took that long. Argentina had it in the 1830s. And Argentina is not known to be known to cutting edge for social justice. They were 100 years ahead of us when it came to our working people. Women voted when? 1919, 1920. Wow. So that the same constitution with persons who are not prepared to fight for working and poor people can be used on behalf of the wealthy or on behalf of everyday people. Would you accept that, brother? Uh, Parts of it. Huh? Pro probably parts of it. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, I'm, I'm less inclined to, 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 right, to see right. our, our, our military as an imperial uh, well, it, but uh, force. We, we, we've been an empire, though, yeah. since Well, the... I mean, you know, we, we uh, men like uh, my father, Joseph George, uh, uh, my father-in-law, uh, Irving Schramm, marched over to Germany and, 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 and they defeated Hitler well, and they came was, home. That was grand hero. And, and, they, came, and they, came, they didn't occupy, they weren't like the Roman legions, they weren't like Caesar. Uh, you know, they, they, they defeated the, the, the Nazi tyranny and they, they came home and they handed to the German uh, people a democracy, they handed to the Japanese people 
uh, a, uh, a democracy. So I think that the picture's it's, complicated. And yeah, I do think yeah. we need to be, I, need, I think we need to be respectful to our military. Yes. I think we need to be respectful to our veterans. Um, uh, you know, a lot are feeling disrespected these days. Right. And, and right. That's, that's, right. that's not... That's, that's not good. I think all of us as Americans should acknowledge whatever mistakes we have made when it comes but to the use of our military. The rulers. They're following the rulers, and they're the yeah, courageous well, ones yeah. willing to put their lives on the line. But it's the rulers who often, too often don't have the kind of vision sure. required relative to the courage of, of the ordinary soldiers in the country. Yeah. Let's hear from Hassan in Carmel Valley, California. Hi, Hassan. Hello, good morning. It's an honor to be uh, on your show. Um, Mr. West uh, put it the best. Uh, if we didn't have C-SPAN, I'm not sure what would have happened to us. Um, I, I see that during the whole talk, you, you two gentlemen are talking about truth-telling and the role of the family. And I, the, my question is, what kind of uh, parents uh, would you suggest you would be or your neighbors or your friends would be when they talk to their kids about the sources, the main sources of, of the human uh, problems right now, uh, ISIS mm. and, and the force of religion uh, in, our, in our culture in, in this country. The ISIS actually, when they chop off a reporter's head or someone they arrest, believe it or not, they call it Sunnat Ibrahim. They call it Abraham tradition. So, see, their hero is Mr. Abraham, that is revered by Muslims and Jews and, and, and Christians. So, if we introduce this man as a hero to our kids, then of course we will have people like ISIS. Of course, we will have failed states like Iran, Pakistan, Israel, Sudan. Afghanistan, all these countries are failed institutions, failed states. And I guess, please bear with me because you encourage your viewers to talk about the truth. So this is my version of the truth that we have to face the fact that these failed institutions, Judaism and Islam, are failed institutions. And All like, right, Hassan, uh, I think we got your point. We're almost out of time. Gentlemen, we have three minutes for that question. Ooh, I think we need to be very truthful with our children about all things. And uh, when it comes to religion, uh, the truth is that some of the greatest, most heroic, most generous things that have ever been done have been done on the basis of religious motivation and in the name of God. But the other side is some of the most dastardly, horrible things that have been mm -hmm. done have been done on religious motives and in the name of God. ISIS does act in the name of God, and as far as we can tell, that is sincere. It's horrible, it's unjust, but these people, religious fanatics, sincerely believe they're doing what God wants. So there's no guarantee of justice just because you're doing it on religious motivations. Now, the rest of the truth is, some of the most horrific deeds ever done in human history have been done on a secularist motivation. The great tyrannies of the 20th century that are responsible for the highest death tolls of any regimes in human history were avowedly secularist regimes, the Nazis and the, and the communists. So I don't think it's fruitful uh, to, uh, to try to, to, to draw up a grand balance sheet and say on the whole religion is good or on the whole religion is bad, but to recognize that good things can be done in the name of religion and bad things can be done in the name of religion. Let's try to do good things and avoid bad things. When, when it comes to what I think we should all agree is the best in religion, the idea of the dignity of the human person, Jews and Christians understand the person made in the image and likeness of God. Other traditions may have a different way of, of articulating the basis of that dignity, but still, when we focus on religion's teaching that all human beings have dignity and worth and are not reducible to the status of ants or, 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 uh, or, or, or rats, then we will do good things. Then we will honor people. Then we will practice virtue. And in fact, I think we're just talking about the history of the species. Now, when Edward Wilson, at the end of his career, he talked about what do we need? And he's a social biologist, evolutionary theorist. We need something to 
push back our egotism, our tribalism. We need universal visions in which people can be brought together focusing on the most vulnerable. Well, that's what is the best in many ways in both religious and secular tradition. Most of human history is a history of mendacity, criminality, hatred, envy, contempt, domination, exploitation. How do we disrupt it? And you only disrupt it by keeping alive traditions of love, of love of truth, beauty, goodness, and enacting that love with body, mind, soul, group, network, organization. And democracy is one of these very difficult efforts to fuse a love of truth and goodness and beauty so that it might disrupt a longer human history of domination. But we know imperial democracies have their own forms of domination, so they're incomplete, they're unfinished. But in the end, you got one life to live biographically. What are you going to do in relation to your own love of truth and goodness and beauty and how would be how would be connect how will it be connected to to others involved in a similar quest? Can, can I say something to parents based on my thirty now thirty three years of, uh, of of teaching at Princeton and that is this parents please care as much care more about the integrity of your children, care more about mm -hmm. their character, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. care more about who they are as Absolutely. human beings than you do about whether they get into Williams or Yale or Princeton or Ohio State or wherever it is and go on to Harvard Law School or go on to Goldman Sachs or something like that. It, we're right as parents to care about the professional futures and the material sure, futures sure. Uh, of our children. We're white to encourage them to aspire to be persons of high standing and, and, and make good incomes and so forth. That's very important. I'm not denigrating that. But what's more important than that is character and integrity. And that's where your real focus as parents needs to be. Robert George of Princeton, Cornell West of Harvard. Thank you for being on Book TV. Pleasure. Thank oh, you. thank you. It's always a blessing. Brother this brother here. Yeah. Indeed, yeah. indeed, indeed. Yeah. Thank you so much, though, brother.